Okay, well, it's 10.02. It is Saturday. We really appreciate all of you for taking time out of your wonderful Saturday to be with us today. So let's go ahead and get started. We have a really exciting day planned. Um, so hi, folks. My name is Adrian Wren. I'm with Valley Vision. We're a, a nonprofit located on 3rd Avenue in Oak Park in Sacramento. Um, and I'm joined by friends and colleagues with Civic Thread, which is formerly Walk Sacramento, as well as Breathe California and Green Tech Education. So thank you all again for being here. Um, and we're actually here this morning as, as part of the Sacramento Neighborhoods Activating on Air Quality, or SNAC project, which is an effort to support two of the Sacramento region's most polluted communities, North Sacramento and Oak Park, in monitoring their air and taking action to reduce pollution. At the end of the day, we're, we're simply seeking to improve public health in our communities. And I'm going to paste in the chat just a little bit more background info about this project and our effort to date. Um, so check that out if you'd like. Um, but today we're actually hosting a design challenge. And really what that means is that we're going to learn about how air quality affects us and then put pen to paper in recording and prioritizing what actions we can take here in our neighborhoods. It's part of a, a new California program called the Community Air Protection Program, or AB 617, uh, which is intended to cede decision-making power to community members in mitigating air pollution and then backing those resident-led decisions with funding and the state's regulatory, uh, regulatory authority. So with this program, we have a unique opportunity to better understand our air quality and to actually do something about it. So we'll, we'll go into the program a little bit more soon, but the meat of today is really going to be in our breakout sessions. So we're actually gonna break out into groups and then we'll do a deep dive on one of three specific issues to shape what we'd like to do next as a community. And, and when you guys registered, you did sign up for a breakout room and we have that information. Um, so we'll have a lunch break after we do some breakout discussion uh, and we'll have some awesome entertainment uh, as part of lunch. Um, and then we'll head back into our breakout rooms to finalize our list of actions. So. After that, we'll report out on our priorities, and then we'll invite a guest speaker from another environmental justice community of Stockton, California, to share his perspective on where to go next. So uh, just a few logistics. As you've likely noticed, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar. Um, that's simply in order to be interactive. If you have questions that you'd like to verbalize, please use the raise hand function uh, on Zoom. And depending on your version of Zoom, it's either under the participants button or the reactions button. Uh, those of you using the Zoom app on iPhone or Android should have this option. And then those of you calling in, I, I know I see at least one of you, just dial star nine to raise or lower your hand and then star six to mute or unmute. There's also a chat box for your comments and I'll regularly elevate questions from the chat. Um, thank you to SMUD uh, and, and the California Air Resources Board for providing funding and support for this program. And then to uh, my partners, uh, Civic Thread, Breathe, uh, California and Green Tech. And then most of all, you guys for taking time out on your Saturday. So thank you. Um, so we'll all introduce ourselves in just a minute. But first, I'd actually like to kick it off by introducing Sacramento City Council Member and Chair of the Sac Metro Air District, Eric Guerra, to talk about why doing this work is so important. So uh, Eric, would you mind uh, providing some remarks for us? Good morning, everybody. Well, uh, first of all, let's give a big uh, virtual round of applause. I'll use my emoji over here. And uh, maybe a little hard for Adrian Wren and uh, and the uh, um, uh, all of the partners in this effort here. You know, I want to I do want to thank Valley Vision. They have been a leader in our our uh, effort to improve air quality in our region. And right now, um, you know, I'm not only excited to be here as a council member uh, that lives right here off the Stockton Boulevard Broadway corridor. Uh, all of us who live in this area know that air quality doesn't stop at political boundaries, right? The, uh, the air quality moves around us. And so all of us are involved. And I saw here that we've got friends not only from Oak Park, but also Lawrence Park in, in South Oak Park, Tahoe Park, Colonial Heights. Uh, all of us get affected. So I think uh, the, the ability of all of us to work to, uh, together is critical. So I get to be here as a neighbor, but also as a council member. But I think more importantly, as chair of the Air Quality Management District, which is basically our public health agency that looks at maintaining and keeping our air quality standard for the region. And right now, uh, we are embarked on the largest municipal air quality effort uh, that, uh, that most cities have ever seen, not just from this effort here, but Valley Vision, this community effort looking at North Sacramento and Oak Park is also partnered up with uh, the air district that already has a number of air monitors. 
the city of Rancho Cordova has now funded their own local community air monitors. The city of Sacramento just allocated half a million dollars for community air monitoring and also community engagement. And we're gonna have a mobile high, uh, high uh, air monitor to go out and look at different uh, areas. So once we uh, find something different, we can go out into a different area. And the County of Sacramento has also embarked on this. So six major large efforts of monitoring air quality. And we know what I'm excited about is not so much uh, all of this monitoring, the data is critical. I'm an engineer by training, getting the data is critical. But what is exciting about this is the community effort, educating all of our community about uh, air quality, getting the data, but then the next step is the most important part. What are we gonna do to improve our air in the areas that need it? And right now we are doing some things to do that. Uh, we just electrified, particularly in North Sac, the Twin Rivers school buses, the largest electric school bus fleet in the nation. So for the North Sac community, you know, a big round of applause for their leadership. They, they worked with the Air District. The Air District led this on, and we worked with uh, Twin Rivers and also Vacaville, interestingly enough, to be the leaders in electrifying the largest electric school bus fleet in the nation. And now we're employing local folks to build them here in our own region. That led to, to Elk Grove being the second largest electric school bus fleet in the nation. And now we've got Natomas and SAC Unified and San, uh, San Juan catching up, all to improve our air. But none of that, none of that can happen if we don't get the right data looking at our air quality uh, uh, specifics for our community so that we can go out and recruit those dollars, those resources from the federal government, from the state government about the impacts that we need. So I'm excited here to say thank you for everybody, to my own neighbors for being out here, uh, to being involved. I wanna put my uh, information here on the chat as well, because this is a community effort where it's a neighborhood led effort, uh, cityofsacramento.org. Um, you know, and all of us, uh, if, if you've driven down Stockton Boulevard along the Colonial Heights uh, Theater here, uh, we've got, we're doing a lot of, uh, of work together. Uh, also uh, on Facebook, uh, let's see, here's my handle. Easy, Eric Guerra, there. Stay in touch. And then lastly, for the younger crowd on the Insta, uh, let me put that on there, at Eric uh, Guerra. Uh, stay connected. We're all working together. Si se puede. Let's go Sacramento. Thanks, Eric. And appreciate you. You must type that a lot. So appreciate you doing that. <laughs> Wonderful. Trying to stay connected, man. I think that's the best way we can do it as much as we can in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, what do you call it, COVID world. I will do one last plug here. We are starting, for those in the community, we are starting outdoor. This is why air quality is important. We're starting our outdoor story time at the Colonial Heights Library again. And then tomorrow morning, we're also doing some tree planting over at Bell Coolidge Library to try to improve our air quality. So thank you again. And yes, uh, keep in touch. Awesome. Thank you. And really, again, I want to thank, want to thank uh, Eric as well as all of you again for taking time out of your, your Saturday to be with us today. Um, those of you who are, who are residents of, of North Sacramento and Oak Park are, are being paid to be here. So I, I will pr be providing more detail on providing you all with stipends, but uh, that is email-based. So if you have not provided uh, an email, I, I know when you registered, you provided an email address to us. That's the email we'll be using and referencing in terms of getting you your stipend, okay? So if that if that happens to change for any reason, I'm going to just drop my email in the chat here. I'm going to make sure I don't make a mistake typing it like, like uh, Eric did not. Um, there we go. So shoot me an email if, if for whatever reason the email that you registered with is not the, email, the right email to send stipends to you with, okay? So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Kiara Reed with Civic Thread. She's going to... Uh, facilitate us all getting to know each other. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, I can see on our participants list, we have about 54 people here. So great turnout, really excited to be here with everyone. Um, as Adrian mentioned, my name is Kiara Reed. I'm the executive director of Civic Thread, formerly Walk Sacramento, and I'm an Oak Park resident. So we have a little poll to help get us um, acquainted with one another and see who's in the room. So what you see on the screen here is a poll. Uh, when you respond to the poll, your answers will show up in real time on the screen. Uh, David on my team is going to drop the information in the chat. You're welcome to use your web browser to click that link and uh, participate in the poll. Or you can text Civic Thread 250 to the number 22333. And we're asking, what is your name? Uh, what is your affiliation? And what neighborhood are you coming from? 
um, and you only have one chance to respond. So uh, try and do it all in the first in the first message. All right, we got some responses coming in. Mary Yang, one of our neighborhood coalition members. And if folks are having any issues uh, dropping their information in the poll, feel free to put it in the chat. That'll work just as well. Oh, awesome. We've got some, some Oak Park folks in the room. North Sac folks. Uh, uh, less, uh, sorry, Stephanie has a question about what we mean by affiliation. Sure. So by affiliation, um, you might be affiliated with uh, a neighborhood association, um, an organization that, you know, is working on similar things. Um, it could be a local PTA, and it doesn't have to be anything at all. Yep. Community member. That can be your affiliation. That's right. All right. A special, well, special shout out to Green Tech. Uh, Green Tech has, I believe, around nine of its youth with us today as part of their every Saturday. They do really cool programming, uh, and and they're they're with us today. So really appreciate the Green Tech folks. Shout out to you guys. Uh, awesome. Can I have a few more seconds? I tried to text, but it wouldn't go through. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go to the website. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can click on that link to go to the desktop version and enter your information there. Awesome. Got some United Latinos members in the house, seeing some familiar names and a lot of new names. Oh, got Dave Tamayo in the room. Very cool. What's up, Avery? North Sack. All right. Well, as this is starting to slow down, I'm gonna go ahead and move us in, move us along. So thank you for everyone who participated in the poll. It's really great to know who's in the room with us. Um, and I think it's also a great segue into acknowledging whose land we're on. And so uh, with that, I wanna share that the Sacramento area is located on the ancestral and tribal lands of the Nisanan, Maidu, Miwok, and Miwok peoples who, although the original stewards of this land have been system systemically and institutionally dispossessed and displaced through the colonial practices of forced removal, ethnic cleansing, and genocide. Today, Wilton Rancheria is the only federally recognized tribe in the Sacramento County. So we believe it's important to provide public recognition and pay respect to the indigenous peoples of the land we're currently on. So let's go ahead and take a moment of silence and do just that. Thank you. For more information about land acknowledgements and how to do one, we encourage you to visit the Sacramento Native American Health Center. And if you'd like to explore an interactive map, uh, like the one you see on the screen, which shows um, the indigenous territories of where we currently are, uh, we have a link that we'll go ahead and drop in the chat as well. And David, if you could drop those, that would be most helpful. All right, Adrian, I'm going to pass it over to you to give a little bit of background on the community air protection. Thanks, Kiara. And would you like to continue to share your uh, slides and have me say next slide, or would you like me to share mine? Yeah, go ahead and go ahead and just let me know when you want me to move on to the next slide. Okay, great. So, so thanks again for everyone uh, joining us today. I just wanted to provide a little bit of background about the work done to date. So. Um, so bear with us, but this is important background as we move into our kind of working sessions, our breakout sessions for, for today. Um, in, in late 2017, there was a piece of legislation called AB 617 that was signed. Um, it created this community air protection program run at the California Air Resources Board at the state level. And this is the program that is funding our work together today. Uh, and really what this program is all about is empowering California's most polluted communities with actual decision-making power um, to address their environmental uh, justice issues in their neighborhoods. Uh, there's currently 17 selected formal communities uh, around the state. Uh, North Sacramento and Oak Park are not part of this group. You'll see that South Sacramento Florin is on this map. And, and Kiara, if you go to the next slide, 
um, you'll see a little bit more about South Sacramento Florin. Um, but North Sac and Oak Park are areas where, where there are real pollution concerns and that's why we're, we're doing this work in them. Um, but a little bit more about South Sacramento. Uh, it was part of a, a, a big advocacy effort back in 2018 because um, Sacramento historically doesn't really get its fair share of cap and trade funding from the state of California. And cap and trade is basically where polluters pay into a, a fund uh, and they keep doing their thing. <laughs> and then the fund is intended to fund project like clean air projects. Um, so uh, you can go to the next slide, Kiara. Uh, so that, that brings us to our, our project today. So uh, since about May of 2020, uh, we've been working together, Valley Vision, Civic Thread, Breathe California and Green Tech Education on the Sacramento Neighborhoods Activating on Air Quality Project with many of you. A um, few of the, the components of our work uh, have, have included listening to community members about where they'd like air monitors located, then deploying solar powered air quality monitors around North Sacramento and around Oak Park, um, educating our community, having uh, uh, some recent meetings and, and even, even in-person walk audits that you'll hear from Kiara about, where we're actually beginning to identify actions and, and, and locations of concern in our neighborhoods, ultimately with the goal of creating a community air action plan for each neighborhood, one for North Oak Park and one for, uh, uh, sorry, one for North Sacramento and one for Oak Park. Next slide. Awesome. Go ahead, Kara. Thanks, thanks Adrian. Um, so the community engagement process of this project kicked off last winter with a survey and series of listening sessions designed to share more information about the project itself, um, assess concerns related to air quality, identify priorities and locations for sitting the air quality monitors, and lastly, to begin brainstorming ideas for the development of the community air quality action plans that Adrian was just talking about. So the primary outreach efforts conducted were a series of virtual listening sessions. And as you can see on the screen, we did those in a number of different languages to ensure that we were reaching all members of the community. And um, we partnered with a lot of our uh, local community-based organizations to help, it, help us reach those communities, which include folks like uh, Vietnamese American Community of Sacramento, Hmong Youth and Parents uh, United, and of course our, our colleagues on the call, United Latinos. So during these listening sessions, um, our team got to learn directly from residents about, you know, what some of the concerns they had were, and we also shared a number of existing conditions uh, in each community to help paint the picture of what we're currently dealing with. So I'm going to hop into some of those existing conditions now, just to give you an overview of what these communities um, currently look like. So what you're seeing on the screen is, are the existing conditions for the North Sacramento project area. So for context, each of the boxes you see on the screen are data points for the corresponding census tracts indicated by the arrows. So you can see, I'll pull up the little laser so you can see it, um, but this data is corresponding to this census tract. Uh, it's also important to note that the red points are unhealthier in comparison with Sacramento County, and the green data points are healthier in comparison with Sacramento County. And you can see Sacramento County averages in this rectangle over here. So as you can see, there's a lot of red on the screen, right? And according to the Healthy Places Index, um, it's, it's also, uh, according to the Healthy Places Index, um, these communities are suffering from lower healthy community conditions. And it's also important to note that North Sacramento has a higher population of African Americans, Asian, and Latino populations. Uh, the residents there are breathing in more uh, diesel. They have higher traffic density, and that diesel that, that diesel that they're breathing in is coming from things like trucks, buses, and other things that use diesel engines. So it's not looking great here in North Sacramento. So you may have noticed that uh, the census tracts in um, North Sacramento have also corresponding health impacts that relate to, the, to, relate to those uh, issues like pollution. So across the board, you see higher rates of heart disease and asthma and lower life expectancy. Moving into the Oak Park existing conditions, um, as many of you probably know, Oak Park is a historically black neighborhood. And as you can see, there's a lot of similarity in the Oak Park and North Sacramento data points. So let's, it's, it's red across the screen. I mean, there's a few of the green areas, um, but the data is telling us that Oak Park residents are breathing in more diesel coming from things like, again, trucks, buses, and other equipment that use diesel engines. Uh, there's a 30% higher level exposure to toxic chemicals when compared to all census tracts in the state. 
Um, and, and let's take a look at like what that means in practice. I mean, we know that there are seven gasoline stations, multiple highways, major arterial streets that cut through and surround the neighborhood, in addition to having higher traffic density when compared to the rest of Sacramento County. And again, very similar to North Sacramento, you see that there's lower life expectancy across the board, higher rates of heart disease and higher rates of asthma. And I think it's incredibly important to note that this is not uh, by accident, this is by design. Um, residents of, of Oak Park and Old North Sacramento are exposed to a higher level of pollutants, and it's often because of racist decisions in the way we use our land. So these two neighborhoods and other communities with large populations of low-income Black, and, Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, have been exposed to, you know, building highways and roads and industrial areas that are next to these communities. So before we move on, I want to acknowledge that, you know, this, this data isn't pretty, right? It can bring up a lot of emotions, um, a lot of feelings, and we know that it, it may not be easy to look at. So we encourage and invite you all to drop how this data makes you feel in the chat, um, because we think it's important to have conversations around how this actually impacts our lives, both physically and emotionally. And while folks are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Adrian to chat more about air monitors and the placement of those air monitors in Oak Park. Yeah, thank you, Kira. So um, early in the project, after, after hearing uh, folks' concerns about, about uh, neighborhood environmental justice issues, we uh, went through a process of engaging neighbors in placing air quality monitors in locations around their communities. And so the, the map that you're seeing here is actually generated via Google My Maps. We had a series of meetings where listen to folks about specific intersections or locations they wanted to, to monitor more closely. Uh, and, and then, of course, Valley Vision, uh, as sort of the equipment leads, would go out and, and deploy these monitors. So we started by pinning specific, specific locations and then kind of, uh, you know, went over it a couple of times uh, and then had to, of course, reach out to property owners and others to, to, to actually locate the monitors and place them. Um, so this is a, a map of the initial locations where monitoring was, was desired. You can go to the next slide. And I'm seeing a lot of good feedback come through. And then these are the, the air quality monitors that were placed. Um, if you go to the, the link, maybe one of my colleagues can paste the link to the map in the chat. Um, but you, you can look at what they're reading now, actually. Um, they're still up. <laughs> they're these solar-powered Clarity Node S monitors um, that, that, that we procured that really measure particulate matter. So particulate matter is things like smoke and, and, and uh, vehicle exhaust and small particles in the air. Um, uh, that, that can actually get into your bloodstream and, bloodstream and cause some real harm. So that's what these things are measuring. Um, they also measure nitrogen dioxide as well. Uh, but but the, the whole purpose of this is to see, you know, basically see live what's happening in our, in our neighborhoods with respect to air quality. Um, you can go to the next slide. These are pictures of us deploying them on rooftops in North Sacramento. Uh, I think on the left is the roof of Robertson Community center, and on the right is the mutual assistance network building uh, at eight ten grand. Uh, next slide. And we also got some good media attention once we placed these monitors and began to to um, you know make public this data. Um, both you know Fox forty, Cap Radio, Univision, and the SAC B all covered this as an important way for folks to learn more about uh, air quality in their communities. Next slide. And Kiara, would you like to speak about the education for, for all curriculum? Yes, sorry, I was looking for the, the, the mute button. Um, yeah, so Breathe California in partnership with the rest of the SNAC team developed a clean air for um, all education curriculum in partnership with Breakthrough Sacramento. So this education curriculum was delivered to the students who were in the sub summer program of Breakthrough Sacramento. And the uh, curriculum featured five interactive lessons and activities structured around air quality, uh, designed for middle school students and included facilitators guide and student workbooks. Uh, the content that we covered in that was A, what's in the air, uh, B, our air, our health, so how the air quality impacts your health, both indoor and outdoor, uh, be air aware, uh, the air inside. So a full a full session on you know how your the products that you use in your home could be contributing to poor air quality, and opportunities for being the change in your community. So it featured an air quality champion checklist, which really encouraged the youth to get out and make some changes in their community, whether those be 
um, policy advocacy, um, you know, trying to plant some trees, uh, starting a starting a like a green focused group at school, or even just committing to walking and biking around their community. And I'm seeing in the chat that folks would love to see some of this curriculum. We do have this curriculum available and we're, we'd be happy to share it with folks. Here's just some of the photos of the students participating in the air quality curriculum. You can see um, on the right hand side that one of the things that they did was uh, build air, um, air purifiers using box fan and filters. Um, I will say that we do have an upcoming community-based uh, block party that we're doing in both, both neighborhoods, and we will be giving out some of these materials as prizes for folks that are interested. We've also embarked on a community-based planning effort, which I kind of just alluded to before, and um, that was put on by the Civic Thread team. And we work closely with our neighborhood coalition members using a train the trainer model to support them in engaging, uh, engaging with and delivering education uh, to their neighbors. So as part of this process, uh, four of our neighborhood coalition members hosted intimate listening circles with their neighbors to share more about the project, understand residents' concerns and develop solutions together. I wanna take a moment to give a big shout out to Stacy and Chassier, Julia and Mary for leading these conversations. They all did a phenomenal job. Um, the project team also developed a self-guided environmental justice tour packet. These packets feature an interactive map, um, which it, it shows on the interactive map, all of the permitted facilities. And these are, these are facilities that are registered with the air quality management district that are um, potentially, or are polluting the community. It also features all of the schools and sensitive receptors like parks or childhood child care centers, where the monitors are located, and it really encourages folks to go take a walk in your community. Um, you choose your own adventure, you decide where, you're, where you want to go, but start taking a look at what's in your community and start thinking about how that impacts your health. So we do have those packets available as well. Residents who return their packet by March 7th um, are co being compensated for $25. Uh, if folks are interested in participating, feel free to shoot me an email. And if one of my team can drop my email in the chat, that would be most appreciated. And we'll get you a packet as soon as we can. And last but certainly not least, uh, our team is hosting two virtual community block parties where we're really going to celebrate the hard work of the neighbors. Uh, we want to play some air quality themed games and give away some really awesome prizes. So some of those prizes you can see on the screen, uh, we're going to be doing $50 gift cards, goodie bags that feature swag from some of our um, local restaurants, coupons, discounts. Um, and we're also gonna be uh, giving away those, bo those uh, box fan and filters like, I sh like you saw on the previous slide um, that the Breakthrough Youth put together. So folks who are interested in attending, uh, looks like David's already dropped the links to those. Uh, just be aware that you know, there's two different events, one for North Sac and one for Oak Park. So, just make sure you're registering for the correct one because they are on different dates. Now, before I pass it back to Adrian, I wanna share one last thing, which is our snack air quality playlist on YouTube. Um, this features a video education series uh, and an oral histories of residents in Oak Park and North Sacramento. You can check it out to learn more about how air quality has impacted your neighbors um, and, and hear directly from them. And uh, you can use your phone to just scan that QR code that you see on the screen to, to, and it'll take you right to the playlist, which features both of these things. And the video series is a three-part series, and it's really designed to give you information about why we're doing what we're doing, um, what the data means, and how you can be involved in your community with advocacy and education efforts. Adrian, I'll go ahead and pass it back to you now. Thanks, Kara. This is a, just a timeline of our project. So you can see, and we, we talked about these components uh, just a minute ago, but you know, we did our neighborhood surveying sort of in the winter of 2021, 2020 to 2021. Sighted monitors in the spring, began really collecting data in the summer, starting in May, um, and then had our, our educational curriculum and oral histories deployed in, uh, in the summer and the fall through, um, as Kiara said, through Breakthrough Sacramento and Green Tech. Uh, we're currently in our community-based planning and design challenge phase, and then really the, the final product of our, our, of our work um, uh, through March is uh, these community air action plans for each neighborhood. And again, the whole idea is we want to get CARB's help, that California Air Resources Board, the state's help 
in enforcing and uh, the, the actions that we come up with today uh, and funding those actions as well. Uh, and then we you can go to the next slide. This is just an example of, of sort of when we started collecting the data, what we were seeing. And on the left, you'll see the AQI index or the air quality index, um, basically color coded uh, by how bad the air quality is. So if you're green, you're you're pretty good. You're if, if you're under 50 AQI, you're pretty good. If you're yellow, you're in moderate territory. If you're orange or red, things are getting worse. Uh, if you're over red, that's bad. That's unhealthy. Um, so it's kind of funny because because we we checked our air monitoring data. If you go back to the last slide, we we checked our air monitoring data on the fourth of July, and we're able to see where fireworks were were going off. That was kind of interesting. We we didn't anticipate that being sort of a use of these air monitors. And then on July 28th, we we had a, a wildfire uh, east of, east of the east of Sacramento, and we're able to see kind of where the the smoke was sort of uh, going through the neighborhood. Next slide. So we have some findings to share with you today uh, about what our monitors have picked up after six months of monitoring, uh, roughly July through December. Um, this is a map of North Sacramento, uh, and you can see various boxes for where our monitors were located. And uh, the basically, you know, we have one through seven, and if you look in the top left of each box, you'll you'll see the corresponding number. So number five, for example, at the top of the map, that's Rio, Linda, and Grand. And then there's two numbers in the box. The first one, the one on top, is the mean average of AQI readings. I know that sounds super technical, but that's basically just the, if you put all the numbers, all the different readings together and then average them out, that's your average number. So 50, again, remember, was moderate. That's not good air quality. That's moderate air quality. And again, this is an average. So half the time, roughly, it's, it's worse. Half the time, it's better. <laughs> uh, and then the second, the second number below that is the median. And that's if you lay out, if you line up all the different readings, and again, these things take readings every 15 minutes, you line up all the readings and you pick one in the middle, that's your median. So they're it's just a different way of looking at averages. Most people probably think of the mean, the top number as the average. So you'll see uh, the, the highest readings were monitor number four for the mean, and then monitor number six for the median. And monitor number four is located at the corner of Norwood and Las Palmas. Uh, actually, on top of a taqueria, I got a burrito there when I deployed that monitor. <laughs> and then uh, monitor number six is at the SAC RT yard near Evergreen uh, in North Sacramento. So just an interesting exercise. And, and those of you in the data, the data breakout can will explore this further. Um, but wanted to just share, you know, how much how different things can be block by block. Um, so, for example, a monitor number seven is 43. Uh, a, mean AQI and monitor number four is 53. So we don't really have a lot of data or information about what a lifetime of living next to a 53 AQI compared to a 43 AQI. It doesn't seem like a big difference, but over the course of a lifetime, who knows? Um, and so this is a really kind of new field of research. You can go to the next slide. So this is Oak Park, um, where, where Kiara and I and others live. Um, we were able to deploy mo more monitors here, 10 monitors. Um, and you'll see that the highest readings are in the south, or in South Oak Park. And, and monitor number six, it has both the highest mean and median reading. Um, so unfortunately, monitor number six is right next to Oak Ridge Elementary School, uh, which again is, is what, what, what those in the air quality business call a sensitive receptor site where, where, where students and children are. Um, it's also near Christian Brothers High School. So it's unfortunate that there, there are such high readings near our, our community's schools. Um, then you'll also see high readings um, uh, at monitor number 10, kind of in the southeast part of, of, of this area near Lawrence Park. Um, so just, just interesting to see. A few surprises, too. I, I was thinking that the monitors closer to the highways would actually have higher readings, or closer to Stockton Boulevard would have higher readings. So this was a surprise. Next slide. So um, wanted to briefly, and we went over a little bit more about like the current project. Again, this event we're having today is part of our current project that ends on March 30th, coming right up. Um, and again, we plan to have at least drafts of those community air action plans developed by March 30th. That's the purpose. Um, and, and you'll see bulleted here just a few of the, um, the, the things, the activities we're going to be doing over the, over the next month. 
Uh, then you'll also see this thing called SNAC 2.0. Again, Sacramento Neighborhoods Activating on Air Quality 2.0. And we've actually, this is a grant we applied for. We were notified this month that we have been awarded this grant, which is really exciting. So just wanted to share that with you um, because it's really important as we think about uh, the next steps, as we think about today's event and what we do next in terms of action. Um, so what, what, what we're going to be funded to do by the Air Resources Board is really to further build out these action plans, put meat on the bones, so to speak. Um, and also, so to do that, to deepen engagement, to have more events, but also a couple of new things. One of those new things is something that Green Tech is gonna be helping to lead, which is an actual emissions reduction pilot project of some sort that, that has a workforce component that might employ local youth or something. Uh, we don't know what that's gonna look like, but that's, that's, that's gonna be something we wanna work with community members to, to develop and to vision. Um, but we, something that will reduce pollution in our neighborhood. Um, so that's something we'll be doing as part of our SNAC 2.0 work starting as soon as April 1st, uh, depending on when the whole contracting process can, can it happen. Another major thing, and, and I might actually pass it to Kiara to see if she has any initial ideas about this, but uh, to, uh, we're going to pilot a participatory budgeting process. And participatory budgeting is a, is a kind of a, it's a new concept, but it really shouldn't be. It's, it's basically just means where the public decides how to spend a public budget, where community members decide how money gets spent instead of other people. Um, so we have set aside $100,000 of this, this, this new grant, basically unprogrammed, uh, to be programmed by residents, to be spent by residents. Um, so residents are gonna tell us how to spend the, 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 that money in advancing the goals of the project. I don't know if Kiara, you have anything to say about that? No, I don't have anything to add as of yet, but we will be working very closely, hopefully with the um, Neighborhood Coalition and PAC members who have already been engaged in the process to help us develop that framework for the participatory budgeting. So stay tuned. We'll have a lot to share um, once, once we start working on SNAP 2.0. Thanks, Kiara. And is there another slide or, or is that the end? We're at the end. Wonderful. <laughs> so, so that's awesome. Um, Thank you all for being patient as we just presented kind of what we've done to, to date, because now's the fun part. Now we actually get to get to work. Um, I just wanted to, but before we uh, kind of go into our breakout sessions, I just wanted to say, make another comment about your stipends for those of you receiving stipends. So um, we will be sending a stipend. I, I will be doing this once we break out uh, for about 40 minutes. Um, and then we're going to have a lunch break after about 40 minutes of work time. Then we'll come back to our working sessions. Okay. Um, and I'm going to pass it off to David in a second to, to detail how that will get done. But uh, those of you who registered and are, and are uh, uh, community members in one of the four zip codes that we're active in, you guys are going to get emailed a special link with a $50 lunch gift card. And that's eligible. That, that works on DoorDash. It works on Grubhub. And it works on Uber Eats. So you're going to get that from me in 20 minutes-ish. Um, when you get that, feel free to place an order for lunch um, so that, and time it so that uh, that thing will get, get here <laughs> when, you're, when you're hungry. Um, and just keep an eye out for that. It will come from uh, this Tango system that we use, uh, and it might go to your spam folder. So again, hit me up if you do not receive this, this gift card, but I will be sending those out. Um, and Stacy, uh, that is a good question. P try to, it's, it's, it's a $50 gift card. Try to... Um, utilize it for through one of those services. If not, just contact me, we can figure something else out. So thank you for that, just an FYI. Um, so the, the purpose of the, the breakout rooms is really to learn about and discuss a specific topic and then to put pen to paper on prioritizing specific actions that we can take in our neighborhoods to improve air quality. And again, the three breakouts and everybody signed up for one of them was equipment, community engagement uh, and outreach and education and a di deep dive into data. So your input in these three areas is gonna be rolled into the creation, again, of these community air action plans. So it's gonna be really important. Um, and this is just a starting list of actions in these action plans. We really wanna work with you to develop these as the project continues. So I'm gonna pass it now to, and Leslie, uh, uh, good question. No, it's good for, it's, it's good uh, forever. Yeah, so it doesn't expire. Um, so I'm going to pass it to David to, to discuss a little bit more about um, the uh, breakouts. Thanks, Adrian. 
so with the breakout rooms in a perfect world, uh, I'm going to go ahead and send everybody to the breakout room that they pre-assigned themselves to. Um, if anybody has any issues, please just put it in the chat. I'll be attending that and we'll, we'll try to get it worked out. Um, 1045, the first session of the breakout rooms are going to start, so you'll be there. At 11.25, I'm going to go ahead and pull everybody out, and you should see a little notification when that happens. You'll have about a minute warning. Uh, and then we're going to spend five minutes checking in with the, the Exploring Equipment breakout room with Niall. Uh, and then at 11.30 to 12.15, we're going to have our lunch, so feel free, move around, get some food, do what you need to do. And then at 12.15, when we come back, Adrian's going to give us a quick kind of reintroduction, check-in. Um, and then we'll launch into our, our second half of the, the breakout room. So again, if anybody has any questions or any difficulties that come up, please feel free to just put it in the chat and, and I will do my best or somebody from our team will do our best uh, to address it. And with that, anybody have Adrian or Kiara, any additions? All right. Thank you, covered it. Fingers crossed this works. All right, folks, we're going to our breakouts. So again, working session, then lunch, okay? Come back after lunch. <laughs> because we're going to pay the stipends out at the end of this, this event. <laughs> the other stipend, the non-lunch stipends. Okay, here we go. All right, I see a pop-up. I'm going to join mine. I hope people enjoyed the, those first uh, pieces of the breakout sessions. Uh, it, the equipment one was lively. Um, so, so next up, uh, actually we'll get, want to pass it over to my friend Niall with Hacker Lab, who is doing some really, really cool stuff uh, with respect to uh, taking apart uh, one of the air monitors that we got. Um, so Niall, I'm going to pass it over to you, and then maybe if one of the team members could, could kind of feature him and make his, make his screen bigger. <laughs> yeah, I think you can highlight me, uh, make it uh, full screen. But yeah, so my name is Niall. Uh, CTO over at Hacker Lab, but my background is kind of, oh no, don't call me a rockstar, that's weird. Um, my background is kind of in uh, electronics and embedded stuff, um, so I'm not an expert in air monitoring specifically in any way, shape, or form, um, but what I do spend a lot of my free time, fun time, and Hacker Lab time doing is tearing apart electronics and making cool things out of them. Um, so when Valley Vision, Kiara, and Adrian, and uh, Civic Thread reached out, um, they wanted to see if I could hack this monitor, essentially tear it apart um, and see what's going on. Um, so I got my hands on one of the monitors, uh, the Clarity node monitors a little while ago, um, and started tearing it apart to see what's going on. And my goal is kind of to open it up, figure out what all the parts are, and figure out if it would be possible to use these outside of their system, right? Uh, can we repurpose these components? Um, so that's what I've done. Um, it's not, it's it's kind of like a proof of concept thing. So it's not completely working yet, I'm doing this live. Um, but part of the goal of this is to show you what this device is, how it works and how it could be repurposed. Um, so with that, let me switch over to, first we'll start with the whiteboard view. This um, is so cool. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, the Clarity's website and just a heads up, like generally the minute you take something apart, you avoid the warranty. So this is probably like, useless to, uh, you, you can't call them and be like, I broke it. Why'd you break it? Because you took it apart, right? Um, but to be fair, it's still working and it's actually still logging data. So if you look at, if you know, you were to see the data, there's going to be one odd data point um, because it's been taking measurements in my shop, um, which surprisingly is not as dirty as I thought it was going to be. Um, but uh, these use the Clarity node, sorry, this one, S model. So here's what it looks like when it's all put together. Um, and it's measuring particulate uh, and per particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide. Um, and so it's a self-powered thing, has its own little uh, uh, solar panel for charging its batteries, and it runs on the cell network. Um, now let's look at what it looks like when it's been uh, uh, taken apart. So let me switch over here. Should be able to still hear me. So right here, we have the different parts of this monitor. Um, so let me use a, something to use as a pointer. So the basic components, right, are first we have the motherboard right here. And you can think of this like 
one of you can think of it like a normal computer motherboard this is the thing with the main processor on board it's responsible for doing the heavier calculations that need to be happening locally um, and it's responsible for interfacing with the network connection and all of the other smaller modules so on this board one thing that's kind of interesting to note is right over here let me see if i can zoom in on it a little bit uh Right over here, yeah, close enough. Uh, right over here, we have the cell network connection modem thing. So that's responsible for talking to the cell network and uh, sending data from this device to the uh, Clarity website. Um, over here is the more interesting part. And if I flip it over, you can kind of see the other side of it. It looks like a black box with an input and output uh, port on the side of it. This is the actual sensor that is taking readings. Um, like I said, I'm not a, you know, the, the folks from CARB know way more about like how these kind of sensors actually work from a measuring, uh, measuring particulate, how, how they're operating, but I'm more interested in how these two are communicating. So I found the, this is the device that is actually measuring the different, uh, taking the measurements and then this, you know, the motherboard sends it back up to the cloud essentially. Um, so my goal is to figure out how these two devices communicate so that I can then communicate with this device from something that's not this motherboard, right? Uh, the idea is let's use our own controller over on a breadboard over here. Uh, so the first step, what I've done, and I think I can get this low enough to see, but if you see these wires right here, I have kind of, tapped into those wires to read the data that's being transmitted between the two devices um, so that I can see how they are communicating with each other. Um, and if we go over here to Salier view, this is where I am watching the data that's being transmitted between the two devices. So I identified what wires are the transmit and what are the receive. And you'll notice these little pulses that go across the wire. This works very similar to something like uh, Morse code, or right, uh, think of an old telegraph line, right? You make a connection, release the connection, make a connection, release the connection, toggle it a couple times and that sends information. These two devices are doing the same thing. So right here, we have the beginning of the handshake, which starts with zero D being sent over, sent over from the, uh, the motherboard to the daughter board. Um, here we can see both. Um, so start with 0D and then the device responds with OK. Um, and then there's an acknowledgement 0F. And then if we scroll out a little bit, it's take, it's doing some readings. Here's some data, which I haven't figured out why it's just sending a bunch of zeros for a little while. But eventually we start to get a real reply with real information back. Um, and then there's even more that comes down later over here. And so here's the actual data that gets sent over after it's been logging for a minute. So uh, this is just the initial update of, you know, what I've got going on. What I'll be doing while y'all are at lunch and going into your next session is seeing if I can get my little microcontroller to replicate these initial signals and grab this data onto my own platform. Is that cool? Super cool. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see one question before we go to lunch, sure. Earl. You're you're between everybody and lunch, so be quick. <laughs> I wanted to provide a justification for what Niall is doing. Clarity <laughs> has a very unusual business model. Basically, they give away the monitor, but they only let you access the data from a public website if you pay a servant an annual service fee which is actually significantly more than the cost of the monitor and. Um, if we, can, if we can hack this to send the signal from the monitor for PM 2.5 and Knox to an alternative website, we can, we can use these devices on a long-term basis and not have to pay $800 per year service fee to Clarity to keep these things operating. Thanks for the work you're doing, Niall. No problem. And to address one more comment in the notes there, um, my plan was to hook, my initial plan was uh, you can get little Wi-Fi connected microcontrollers for under two dollars. Um, if you are already putting this in a in a location that you know is in an urban environment, you know the the community that you know the community center probably has a Wi-Fi connection. You just have to convince them to let you uh, connect to it, right? Even if you don't want to do, deal with cell. That said, uh, 
you can still set up your own cell network connection. There are some low cost data providers out there, which, you know, are, are uh, for the amount of data that we're sending, we're sending like tiny amounts of data on the order of a text message, if not less. Uh, you can find cheaper data plan options, right? The, the, the value that Clarity provides is the entire interface. Interface, it's robust. You have, uh, you have lots of uh, support, right? The biggest thing with paying for a service is that you can call somebody if something goes wrong, right? If I build something and I hack it and something goes wrong, you call me, I might be like, well, I'm, we'll see, maybe. Like, I don't know. I, I, I stuck a soldering iron where it shouldn't have gone, so... Yeah, I, I won't spend too much time, but uh, I think we're already running over what I was allotted. But uh, yeah, that's the idea. So you'll get an update from me later. We'll see how this goes. So much, Niall. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Okay, folks. So it's lunchtime. Uh, again, I'm going to follow up with those of you who, who uh, had trouble receiving your gift cards. Those of you who did, please get some lunch, take a break, bio break, uh, make, make a pot of coffee, hang out. Uh, we will be back at 12.15. 12.15, okay? So that's 40 minutes. Um, look forward to continuing our breakout sessions then and then having a, a, a good old discussion about it. And while folks are at lunch, we do have some entertainment for y'all. Um, David will be queuing that up and giving us some introductions on what you're going to be reviewing. Um, so feel free to stick around or, or tune in while you're eating your lunch. David? Thanks, Kiara. Yeah, so in the tradition of Teatro, when arts uh, were used to bring social issues to the community, United Latinos and Teatro Nogueo, created this comedic satirical sketch to help make us laugh and encourage us to engage in solutions of civic engagement and environmental justice. Uh, and so you can also view the video on their website and find more at unitedlatinos.org. I will drop the link in the chat. Uh, and without further ado, I will share my screen and get the video going. And following that, we have the Our Air, Our Voice uh, video series that Civic Thread helped put on with some community member interviews and, and air quality conversations. Otherwise, enjoy your lunch. Like it's muted, David. Yeah, we're missing the audio. You might have to. I know we just went through this. There we go. Can you turn it up? Welcome, everyone, to the second EJ Anonymous meeting. I am your counselor. I hope everyone's in the right place. Love to see so many familiar faces. Before we get started, let's go over the ground rules. One, this is a safe place for EJ violators. I have a great deal of information from your local and legislative representatives, including organizations like United Latinos, but we want to hear from you too. Let's keep safe with social distancing. Three, share the air. No offense, Eddie Sol. Four, whoever shares today, state your name and the reason you are here. Five, any questions? Oh, you must be one of the rebels from Next Gen. They're always first to ask questions. <laughs> Who wants to share first? All right, go ahead. Oh, well, hello, it's uh, me, Water. Uh, for forgive me for my color, I'm kind of new to all this. Hi, Hi Water. Water. Um, I guess I'm here because I have pollution issues. I moved over from Flint to Grant High in DP, where they found coronium-6 and copper in their waters, forcing the schools to shut off their fountains, and I am jealous someone did that before me. But SAC PD arrested me just for being brown. Talk about profiling. 
And with all that going on, like some days I'm just not sure how I feel because some days I'm feeling blue and I'm feeling crystal clear. And the other days I'm just feeling green, cloudy, dirty, and just not well at all. Thank you for sharing your feelings. It's very refreshing. Um, I'm from all over, you know, Arden, Southside, McClellan, the Paso Heights. I, I, I just spilled over from place to place and I guess I'm here because I just don't know how to filter myself. That's the first step, admitting you have a problem. Well, sometimes my problem is with how others see and treat me. Like, I'm trying to be my best, but it's just really hard when... It sounds like there's a lot of environmental factors. When people around me take me for granted, they use me till they're satisfied and just throw me out. I'm pouring myself out to them, and I'm just tapped out. That sounds like a lot to handle. What do you think you should do? Oh, sometimes I feel like I should ebb and flow into different systems and channels, you know? Surround myself with people who care about me and who treat me with respect. Go on. Well, for example, when I was in Land Park, I was being tested. How so? Well, it was for controlled substances. Let's just say there were a hundred different chemicals, substances, or contaminants detected that had microscopic organisms, bacteria, algae, protozoa, Lead. There's even trash. Keep going, water. And sometimes it's just a lot to take in. Like, when my levels go high, I can hurt other people. I don't mean to hurt other people. I just, I just boil over and I feel contaminated and then I contaminate others. What tools do you think you can use to change your behavior? Um, I know there, that there's this consumer's confidence report which lets me know where my levels are at, so I know when I'm not right. And then I could read certain surveys or articles about the proposed regulations in my area. And I guess I can start to contain myself and just bottle it up. Plastic bottles have always been there for me, and I'll, I'll let plastic take that one on. Great work, Water. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Hello, I'm Plastic, and I'm a polluter. Hi, Plastic. Well, I gotta say these last weeks have been very transformational for me. Since I joined EJ Anonymous, everyone has given me a welcome hand, regardless of this plastic face. The team has been very supportive to me, especially my friend Bottle Water. They have motivated me and inspired me for these last weeks. But I couldn't have done it without the 12 steps of environmental consciousness. And for that reason, I would like to read the first one to the group, if I may, Counselor. Go ahead. We admit that we are powerless over our pollution, that our lives have become unmanageable. It means that we admit that no amount of effort can stop my dirty ways. Good analysis, Plastic. Before I decided to come to EJ Anonymous, my life was a total mess. Back in 2019, I went to that festival, Aftershock, next to the park. Can you imagine hundreds of people along with the excruciating sound of death metal, vendors, artists, and oodles of pollution all in one place? I would jump into the mosh pit, adrenalize myself, eat all the food I could, throw all the garbage I can. I was adrenalized to the max. Right before the death tones end of the night and everyone got ready to exit out, I realized for the first time I was hurting everything around me. There was even a turtle suffocating through one of the plastic rings I threw away. That is the most important thing. Reality hitting your head. Boy! I realized I was putting myself before the environment. Not like a Lisa Herrera from the uh, Latino Leadership Council or Luis Sanchez from the Community Resource Project. They always use recyclable containers. As I was walking out, I saw all the garbage, cans, bottles, paper, everywhere. I stared at the sky, and the only thing I could see was a cloud of smog. I felt terrible. I felt like trash. So what changes have you done since then? Well, I'm more environmental conscious. For instance, now when I'm at work and I see a coworker throwing an empty can or bottle, I rescued as I would be a left fielder trying to catch a ball. I walk to the aisles of the office, and if I see an empty can or bottle, 
I make sure it goes to the right recyclable container, plastic or composite. Excellent. Well, who's going to take the initiative? Who's going to stand up for Sacramento? The government? We need more people like Chet Hewitt from the Sierra Health Foundation. You are right. We all need to stand together and do our part. Thank you for your testimony, Plastic. Thank you, Counselor. Who's next? Hello, I'm Arisol, but my friends call me Air. Hello, Air. <clears throat> I said my friends call me Air. Hello, Arisol. I'm one week clean, and I haven't had a bad air day since July 10th, 2021, but today I feel foggy. Okay, so about 10 years ago, I started contaminating mostly in Del Paso Heights and <laughs> South Sacramento, but 10 years ago, it really wasn't a big deal, and I never thought twice about having a pollution problem. Ugh. In fact, I used to love making people cough and wheeze, and I got worse as the years went by, and no one ever really tried to stop me. But things got really bad when I met my partner, Smog. We were both polluters at the time, and honestly, neither of us wanted to change. <coughs> well, the hippies at Sacramento Catholic Diocese and Stanford Settlement started ganging up on us. And through policies and um, AB 1274, they made her check into Pollution Hab. And then she had to get smog checks. Ugh. And then there's that Victoria Vasquez and her tree planting radicalism. But the tipping point for me, spare the air day. Can you explain what that is for those who may not know? Well. It's a day where they say I'm so bad that everyone stays inside just to get away from me. And then people started calling me names like wildfire smoke and particulate matter. And I guess everyone got tired of me, but I began to start noticing things. Like what? Well, have you noticed that people who live in like East Sac and Land Park hardly have asthma or other respiratory conditions? Why is that? Have you seen all the yoga they do in the park? Ugh. I mean, the hospitalizations in Sacramento went up 59%. That is 43% higher than the whole state. <sighs> I started looking at myself in the air quality index and just didn't recognize myself anymore. How did that make you feel? Dirty, regretful. And next they're telling me that I'm shortening lifespans for elderly, Pregnant women, children. Did I mention the children? Well, what are you going to do to get better? Well, I began making my amends with those that I've harmed. And when I feel like I want to pollute again, I just remember the large book of the 12 steps of environmental consciousness. Step two in particular, I began to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to good quality. And that greater power are those that seek environmental justice, like California Endowment and United Latinos. I know it's up to me to make myself better, but I could only really do it with other support. Thank you for sharing, Air. <clears throat> I mean, Air Isol. That was great. What about you, Fries? You always come in, but you don't share. If you want to get your card signed and you want to graduate, you better speak up. I'm not interested in sharing. I'm only here because of the hours the courts have imposed upon me. That council member, Jay Schreiner, turned me in. Honestly, it's probably yeah. best. What is it? Something wrong? Do you see what you got? Are you right here? Like, 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 and Bluto's Louisiana Kitchen. <laughs> Deep fried shrimp seafood, baby! Uh, you know, 
They call Arden, Del Paso, South Sac, food deserts. I can name lots of healthy, quick food restaurants out there. On Mark Road, they've got that Jolly BB. Ooh, international flair, Asian cuisine. Oh, ooh, and who doesn't want a really great greasy burger with Thousand Island dressing? Oh, Rott's Burger House on Franklin Boulevard. They rule. And besides, don't y'all have grocery stores? Get your veggies there. Fruits and vegetables for everyone. <laughs> oh, you can even get your rice, beans, and tortillas there. there. And even just utensils. That's not really covering your greens. Even the tortillas. Three different places. I don't know. Okay, your lettuce, your salad, your chili, anything like that. Like, uh, I guess you can go get your greens by some tortillas there, but that's just that's about it. It's not enough. Still Paso. Don't you have that 99 cent store? Get your veggies there. My mom does. And and South Sac. Don't you have that food to the less fortunate servicing you? And other stores too. I mean, just because it's not a Whaley's or a Safeway doesn't mean it's not equitable. And, and, and besides, no one ever associated cardiac illness to bad food. It's like climate change. It doesn't exist. And besides, bad air's fault anyway for the rise in the asthma cases. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and is it my fault y'all don't recycle? You blaming plastic? Don't ever change. Plastic rules. Landfill, baby. <laughs> and besides, don't kid yourselves. Medi-Cal will take care of you. You got a sick kid? Take him or her anywhere. Health care for everyone. So go ahead. Eat all of the fries you want. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Healthy food does matter. But I've been lying to myself and to all of you. The courts were right. I do belong here. My name is Fries, and I'm a polluter. Hi, Fries. You can find me in Del Paso, Arden, South Sac. We are a food desert out there, not a healthy place to eat in sight. And where's the justice? And don't get me started on that Medi-Cal stuff. Eat enough of me, and it's heart attack time, baby. And good luck finding a provider or, or being able to take care of the extra cost for the treatment. Just because there are 550,000 people on Medi-Cal does not mean that there's health care for everyone. There are over 150,000 residents living in areas affected by bad air, bad water, Garbage and me, bad food. They just want us to get our act cleaned up. That's all. But we can't do it alone. We need you. You know, there are people out there trying to make a difference. People smarter than me, like that. That Gabriela Herrera from Congresswoman Doris Matsui's office. She's trying to make a difference. Yeah. But until then, I'll just keep coming back here, telling my story. Maybe somebody will listen. Calm said, calm said, breathe. You all know that in order for me to sign your card to graduate, you need to stay for the next EJ meeting. If you don't stay for the meeting, you're not going to graduate. Now, I want to close this session with a passage from an interview with Greta Thunberg. 
I want you to act like the house is on fire. Because it is. Amen, Greta. Amen, Greta. Now our serenity prayer. God, grant us a serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Adios, amigos! Bravo! Amazing. <laughs> that was so good. Even Beckett's trying to talk about how good it was. Um, okay, for anybody listening, we are. Thank you, one Richard and United Latinos and everybody who worked on that. That was a fantastic video. Um, okay, we're gonna switch to uh, the oral histories, the our air, our voice series. Uh, so give me a moment. I don't think we'll have time to get through the whole thing, or we'll just have enough. Let me see. Okay. Vimeo has become part of Mighty Oak's everyday processes. We are using Vimeo links on our website to showcase our work. Keep it going, bud. All right, uh, here's the Our Air, Our Voice Oral Histories. Speaker is Glenn Jackson Jr. I've activated your microphone. You can unmute yourself and begin. Hello. My name is Glenn Jackson Jr. and I'm a 13 year old transportation advocate. Over the past few months, I've been learning to be more of an, to, to be more of a environmental justice advocate. This is my first time making a public comment to the California Air Resource Board. I live in Natomas, which is part of Sacramento. I am asking the board to seriously consider selecting the Gardenland Northgate community for air pollution monitors. Did the board know that Garland was established by immigrant farm workers and railroad employees of whose families still live in the community? Did the board know that according to the 2000 census, 41% of, of Gardenland Northgate residents identify themselves as Latin or Hispanic, which is more than 21% in the city of Sacramento? Did the board know that Northgate Boulevard was extended to be to become a commercial corridor, one of one end of Northgate leads to the I-80 freeway, and the other end leads to I-5 and Highway 160. Did the board know that Northgate Boulevard alone has eight drive-through restaurants, 12 gas stations, and 19 smog and auto repair businesses, along with two schools and seven churches? It said. That it's sad that a lot of disadvantaged communities at this meeting are struggling just to live. Every community, especially underserved neighborhoods with a majority of Black and Latinx residents, wants to breathe clean air. Isn't it a part of the cardboard's mission to protect the public's health by reducing air pollutants? I ask that ask the cardboard to make a valuable contribution to the Gardenland Northgate community, whose health is truly invaluable. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Glenn. We sit in a bowl here in the valley in Sacramento. Uh, it's like um, the altitude level um, coming down, and it's like when when um, there's any forms of smoke, it comes and settles right over the bowl. And so, thank goodness for the trees. So I think definitely the air quality has changed from when I was younger. I think, I think especially with the wildfires recently, that's been affecting a lot of the air quality and air pollution in general. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I've noticed since that big fire me back in 2018 I believe um, I started I, when that air was very foggy or not even foggy very brown mm -hmm. um, it gave me a lot of headaches um, 
throat ache or sore throats. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of like these pain symptoms I always associate to like a cold or flu. Mm -hmm. um, it's just very musty air. I try not to go out during those times, of course, uh, unless I have to. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it just feels like very dirty air. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very like it always like affects my vision. But then as far as air quality goes, I think that there's been a change in the way people look at being outside. You know, there used to be a time we didn't really think about that kind of stuff. We weren't worried about, uh, unless there was a fire or something like that, where it was just like all the way obvious that the air quality was changing. You know, now it's like, uh, unseen gases or some stuff um and i think you um i think it's one of those things that it's hard though to you can see those the freeways and it's clearly there but it's also hard to know that the environment is bad though right i understand that it is like because i'm working in this air quality space and like transportation space and we just know from data that the fumes and all the stuff that's coming from the freeways are affecting our communities but I think it's it is hard to see it if you're not like feeling it if you have the asthma impacts or not right like these are things that are like silent killers in a way of like they will come get you in the afterwards like if you grow up in a community like this then you're probably going to have some kind of breathing issues potentially so um I think it's just to say that like you know physically I don't I can't say that I feel those types of things except when it's like fire season of course you can literally see the air quality is terrible um, but I think that luckily I haven't had that like issues in that sense and again I've been there for four years so I don't know like what long-term implications could be of living in a place so close to a freeway but I think that you see it just by looking at the numbers of like people that do suffer from asthma in these communities right like that's pretty obvious data if you find if a quick google search could probably give it to you so you know that this is happening um and so yeah it's a huge concern because like the overall community the way that it has been built even though at once there was a streetcar going through a park it's still pretty car dominant right and and the bicycle infrastructure isn't really there i mean you look at broadway and you look at stockton they're not there um and then you have people that are biking and stuff but it's like also you have bike share that is in there but then there's also some demographic issues with that right like who's using it so i think like you're we're missing the ability to bring on our um communities of color and particularly in the in the oak park community that they're not like maybe not using those resources but it's also because it's expensive and there's also safety issues that people are thinking about that it's not safe to be on a bike as a as a black person or as a brown person so yeah those are issues that are very prevalent we used to go to a uh, rallies on freeport boulevard but you know that kind of gets poor you know bring her along and you know i bring the grocery carts and the and her and her walker you know and it gets kind of hard getting on public transit with her you know and it you know with the smoke last year we, we traveled one time and we had to just come straight home and we had to close the windows and turn on the air conditioner you know right but you know and what um so you're, you're your mom's caretaker are you concerned sometimes like with the air pollution and your mom's health and making sure that she can stay healthy oh yeah 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 she was uh yeah we recently went uh she was just discharged from the er too over a heart heart issue and um and I had to find all the uh, the devices, you know, online, and you know, because I can't go in person, you know, without without a mask, without, uh, or they might not be open during certain hours. I think my favorite part has been um, the environment, like just the people walking around, right? Like it feels like very friendly, and like the gather area, like that little part over at the um, the Forty Acres building, like it's just like. I love that I can just walk to these places, um, have a beer, have some food, um, have the community events. I think I've been my favorite because um, I, I just didn't grow up around that kind of environment. So my mental health, I, I think besides the pandemic, of course, but the, when the air quality hit, like I was always forced to stay inside or firstly, I prefer to stay inside because uh, it was just better for me in um, physical health wise. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I think there's times of moments where I just felt really lonely just because, you know, I couldn't really do much. Um, I really limited my time outside. Mm -hmm. 
and just felt kind of secluded at those times. Um, and because if I did want to go out, I'd be risking my own health. So that's why I had to avoid as much as I could. Well, I just know that when you have air quality problems, when you have air problems of your own physical, especially with asthma, um, it makes it harder um, to to keep your air, you know, to keep your airways clear. And a lot of times it affects you at night. Um, and uh, uh, that's when you know that you're really taking in too much, you know, of with, with this quote unquote regular. And some of my uh, grandchildren are really, really air sensitive, you know. But a personal experience that I have had uh, when I was back in preschool in South Natomas, I had my first asthma attack. So my mom asked me if I wanted to advocate for the Garden Man Northgate to get air monitors. I said that I would. There are many old people here. So um, sometimes when we go outside, you see now the um, fire, why, huh? the smoke everywhere. So um, it's very uh, difficult for uh, people because they are old. So they are very difficult to breathe. Um, it's like me. Sometimes I want to go out to take the, uh, the breast air to breathe, but it's not easy in the fire day. So um, I think the air qualification is yeah, very good. It's very necessary for people for environment area. So um, it's not easy because some day is good, some day not good. But for our people, they um, usually have cough and uh, uh, it's easy to get um, disease in their lungs or their um, heart. I love, I love the community because I attended uh, Oak Ridge, Fruit Ridge and American Legion. And, uh, even though I wasn't uh, very uh, interested in it, I came back and I went to the school at at the food bank, and uh, I was able to uh, actually pay for my test testing, you know, for GED and all that. And all that's pending, but it, you know, at least I'm I put my foot in the door, yeah. And I'm glad. My mother loves the area. She was a volunteer at the food bank at the downtown one. She worked at various places too, and while we were uh, at school at Campbell Soup, while we lived in Oak Park, you know. And uh, I was able to, uh, she took me at a young age so that I could, uh, she presented me in a, in a Cinco de Mayo dance at a, at a, at a local uh, uh, elementary school. And they, they loved me, so we never moved from Oak Park. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still dance? I, I, I dance a lot. I yeah? A lot of, yeah. Do like, you? I like exercise a lot, yeah. Well, I know that lemon balm is one of the plants that that I uh, use for for that and also um, eucalyptus it grows everywhere wild so I just uh, I just I just go into the community and see the trees up or down and, and find some leaves because some things we only have to grow we actually grow them uh, naturally like the way chamomile is grown in the, in the grass of the uh, street Chamomile is one of those ones that actually calms your your being and um, makes it so it's easier for you to communicate, etc. And relaxes you. you know. uh, and the mints, the different mints, you can actually boil them, uh, any of these um, plants that I was just talking about, and you can boil them in, like in a pot of water and steam it for the house, and that will help to moisten them all. There's a lot of different uh, plants that um, are very good for the lungs and licorice is one and I've never grown licorice, but it's a really good plant for the lung. But uh, as far as uh, people doing things, there were like uh, in communities like in Oak Park, the Tuskegee Flyers wives and the women from uh, the military bases came together in the 1940s and actually put together a, um, 
uh, housing and uh, community-based organization called the Women's City Improvement Center. And um, they um, brought, helped bring um, rental properties and, um, you know, extended opportunities in the community by way of coming to them. Because at one point, there were very few places that we could actually live as uh, African Americans and Hispanic people, et cetera. Um, we had to live in specific areas. And so uh, that was one of the organizations that actually still exists today uh, in different format, but um, that helped the community out. And that was a part of the base. And then in the slides, one of the other things that we were doing at the different community gardens there, uh, the Sugarcane Garden, and also uh, uh, on Vern and Grant, and then the other um, garden that we we're doing out in El Paso Heights area that we've actually been doing for about nine years. You know, and we just continued and have continued to uh, re nurture that soil area so that, that was, that's one of those uh, places that you can go and teach people about, about the earth. We've really been doing different things with Green Tech. Um, I've worked with them for several years and off and on. And uh, uh, there's been a whole lot of really great things happening in the community. The environment air quality is very important, always important for us, for our neighbor, especially for our people. Huh? So um, it, I have some um, relatives and my aunts and my uncle, so uh, I I'm very happy to see them to uh, to grow a lot of tree and um, let their house cleaning tire and um, and they, they know how to um, stop smoking or don't um, they don't know how how to protect them themselves huh, to have good health. Uh, you see, uh, they can go out to breathe uh, the fresh air in the morning, but sometimes it's uh, not, the air is not good, so don't go out at that time. Yeah. Uh, some of my favorite parts of our community is that there there's a grocery store that's right down the street, the walking distance, and a lot of neighborhoods don't have that. Um, Another fair part is that there are safe bike lanes that I can go on. Uh, another part that I like is that there's a smart ride because before that there was no transportation other than to drive, but now we have transportation to go to places where we need to go. Yeah, definitely air quality. I think it's just something that like I don't think of too much sometimes. Maybe if I just had like more access to like um, all the data. Um, it probably would be something I would be able to address more if I knew more about it. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, I think air quality is something that everyone should be concerned about, especially since like with the pandemic and everything, everybody wants to be outside more. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely something that's important. And I think um, maybe if we just had more data, more knowledge about it, it would help everybody address it. How do you see, because if you have good education, you go to school, uh, at least high school, it's easy for people to understand, to see the problem easily. It's important, how it's important to you, to your health, to your neighbor. But uh, for some people with uh, the limit education, it's not easy to tell them because they are old and they have uh, the way of their life for a long time. So it's not easy to change them, but um, for them, I think um, we have to um, um, 
devotion, we have to love them, to care of them a lot, and um, to, to tell them some uh, example clearly that um, they can see easily for the person who live there near their house and who pass away by of the disease. Um, some um, some the true thing, huh? so um, I meet them. Um, That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Shout out to United Latinos for the EJ Anonymous video. That was absolutely wonderful. And to Civic Thread for creating the uh, uh, oral histories video, Our Air, Our Voice. So um, yeah, drop, I, I know the links were dropped in the chat. I'm sure we can uh, drop those again. And then definitely in our follow-up email to all you guys, um, include links there too. Make sure you guys have those. Very cool. So welcome back. Welcome back from lunch. Hope folks were able to take a break. Uh, watch, watch those awesome videos. Um, just to give a little bit of a roadmap for the rest of, of our time together, we're going to hop back into our breakout groups, continue, continue our conversations for about 30 minutes. Uh, that we're going to come out, we're going to share and discuss what we all did. So we're going to come back to the bigger group with, with the outcomes, the actions that we've identified as part of our breakout groups, have a conversation about that. Then we're going to check in with Niall, see what he's been doing with that super cool equipment hack, hardware hack. Uh, and then we're going to have a really cool guest speaker, Matt Holmes from, from uh, Stockton. So really, really excited uh, for these next set of, of things. Um, I think with that, is there anything before we, we jump back into our breakout groups? Anything from the team? Well, let's, uh, let's, let's get folks back into there. And uh, again, this, the purpose of this second sort of 30 minute time frame, we'll, we'll come back together at 1245. We'll come back into the big room, but in the next 30 minutes, please make sure that in your breakout group, you're putting pen to paper and recording some of the ideas and actions that can, that we can actually take to, to address some of the issues around equipment deployment, around uh, outreach and education and around data and data analysis. So. That's the goal. Thanks, Adrian. All right, breakout rooms are starting. As always, if anybody has any trouble or questions, uh, just message me. All right, see everybody at 1245. Hey folks, welcome back. Hope everybody had fun and productive breakout sessions. We're able to put some their pen to paper with regard to some, some actions that we all wanna see. Uh, taken in our communities to address air pollution and environmental justice. Um, so now for about the next, um, the next, what is it, 45 minutes roughly, I don't think we'll actually need that much time, although we'll see where, how things go. Um, we're going to have a conversation, we're going to report out from our breakout groups and have a conversation about uh, how we, how we kind of put all this together in terms of a community air action plan for the neighborhood, uh, for each neighborhood. Um, so we're going to have this conversation uh, till about uh, 1.30 or so, and then we're actually going to check it back in with Niall to see the progress that he's made uh, on, on uh, taking apart and reconfiguring that, that uh, air monitor. I, I can see he just started screen sharing and is doing all sorts of crazy stuff there. So really excited to see, to check in with Niall after our conversation. And then we'll hear from our, our keynote speaker, Matt, uh, and then we'll, we'll talk next steps. So any questions about that? Okie doke. Well, I can, I can begin. So, so again, we had three breakout sessions and I can begin by sharing for the equipment one, which was number one. Um, and, and so, so after equipment, we'll do uh, the education and outreach and then we'll do data third. Okay. So for, for equipment, we had uh, several guests from the California Air Resources Board, some really smart, knowledgeable folks on the equipment side of things. And we're able to talk about what, what concerns uh, folks had about um, you know, about specific sources of pollution in their communities. And then CARB was able to speak to, well, this is the kind of technology that would, that could address that. This is the kind of technology that could address that, that sort of thing. So we, we talked about some of the concerns elevated by folks in our breakout were, 
uh, encampments in, in their communities, particularly homeless encampments, trash fi uh, fires, that sort of thing. Um, highway pollution, um, black carbon. Um, uh, it, it's kind of as part of that highway conversation, also noting that some main, like major thoroughfares that aren't highways, like uh, was cited Arden Way and Franklin Boulevard. Uh, those are also really busy too. And we can't really forget about some of those major roads. You know, Stockton is another good example of that. El Paso um, as, as sort of areas of concern as well. Um, folks talked about um, potentially moving facilities or making sure that homes are not built near uh, facilities that pollute, um, as well as trees. Trees always come up um, for rightly so as a, as a way to mitigate poll air pollution. Um, and, and, and we had a conversation uh, or touched on, on kind of how we could potentially monitor near trees and see how a tree was, uh, you know, uh, potentially mitigating air pollution or to taking particulate matter out of the air. Um, we also talked about how new cars are cleaner than old cars. I know that sounds pretty commonsensical, but uh, to the extent that, you know, we get old cars off our roads, how that could be a, you know, a way to mitigate air pollution concerns. Um, we also addressed smog check uh, and um, some, some potential issues with smog check in terms of like some of the, some of these auto shops not actually, not actually doing legit smog checks and that being a potential problem. And of course, there's, there's apparently some efforts uh, currently around um, basically checking smog checks uh, and making sure that, th that those things are actually happening doing kind of stop and check things. Um, we also talked about asthma being driven by PM 2.5 and ozone and how we could potentially do some monitoring to address that. Um, talked about factories as another area of concern. And then uh, notably, we talked a bit about ozone uh, not being as much of a mon air monitoring priority. Again, ozone is, is like a regional pollutant. So it doesn't make as much sense to invest a bunch of resources in monitoring ozone at a site because it's going to be the same. It's going to be the same in North SAC as it is in South SAC, as it is in like, you know, uh, like Roseville. I don't, I'm not entirely sure of that, but it's really a regional pollutant. So uh, it's kind of of less concern and of less interest to do some air, air, uh, monitoring. I don't know if anyone else from the group wants to share. Adrian, there was a question. Kiara asked if there was a, a device that monitors indoor air quality. We have the CARB folks on the line with us. <laughs> Maybe they can answer that. <laughs> Ken or Dave. Uh... Purple Air makes uh, an indoor unit. I've, I've, I've got a couple of them in my two-story Victorian, one upstairs and one downstairs. They really go off the chart when I do any frying in the kitchen. Nice. That's, that's fun to see. Or maybe not so fun, <laughs> that reality. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is Dave tomorrow. Can I weigh in? Go for it, Dave. Yeah, and, and I'm not trying to minimize the outdoor air pollution from transportation and even smudge plants and, you know, the uh, other sources outside. But it is really important to realize that actually the same communities that are suffering from outdoor air pollution sources are also suffering from indoor air pollution that's largely driven by, you know, substandard housing condition that leads to you know, cockroaches and mold and things like that. So those are very well known to, to be a significant uh, um, source of asthma irritants. So, uh, and it's, it's the same community. So I think we don't wanna lose sight of that as well because there's other things that local jurisdictions can and should be doing about uh, improving us uh, housing conditions. For sure. Uh, folks from CARB, do you want to kind of add on to what Earl said about indoor air monitoring? Uh, so Purple Air has a device. Is there, are there, is there other kind of equipment related things that we could be thinking about? Yeah, there are several for indoor and, and you can actually also use the, the Purple Airs that people use outdoors. Those work just as well indoors um, too. So that, that's an option if you have one of those. Uh, they're typically pretty good at picking up any emissions from, from cooking or if during the wildfires, how much of that smoke is, is making it into the house or during, during the winter time, the pollution episodes, they're, they're usually pretty good at, at picking up those as well. Um, and then there, there are other sensors other than purple air for indoor. Um, I think IQ Air makes one um, and then, um, 
yeah there there are several the aq spec website lists several of those if, if you're interested in looking at different ones but typically they they just measure pm 2.5 and they will try and do uh other um pollutants uh some do voc uh, try and look at vocs but typically at the kind of low cost indoor uh, sensors those are only really going to pick up very high spikes in in VOCs. So it's um, it, we don't really have any information on how reliable those are. Thanks for that. I, I so, can add a, another note. In addition to the permanently fixed monitors like Purple Air, uh, there are handheld instruments. This one costs a hundred dollars. Uh, this is a, a Tem top that uh, I use uh, actually when when walking on trips. And sometimes in the summer with the, the window of my car rolled down, I have it mounted on my dash and I do neighborhood surveys. And that's where I've discovered that uh, fast food restaurants are significant sources of uh, PM 2.5 in our area. Interesting. Let's go to Terry. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, mention like uh, beeswax candles. Are, are are good for indoor air quality so let's say if you got a candle in your house um, they release negative ions and negative ions attract pollutants and you know literally make them to where they're too heavy to remain in the air and then they fall out and hit the ground the same process as rain like you know but yeah it's a cheap little method to having clean air in your house i guess so yeah i hope that was a question I would Thanks for that. With that candles, um, incense sticks produce significant quantities of fine particulate indoors. Uh, I would suggest if you can get a hold of it to, to put a monitor, you know, just on a test basis and burn a candle to see whether um, the literature values, which I'm, I'm mentioning, are, are correct. That's a good idea. One Nothing thing. Like data. Go ahead and. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Strangely, because I've had this monitor uh, sitting on my desk for the last couple of weeks, um, it's been logging. Uh, this isn't my desk. This is kind of my shop. So it was actually sitting right next to my soldering iron um, and my bandsaw uh, for the last couple of weeks. And I can actually see in the data the points at which uh, I was doing shop stuff. Uh, I have a couple air filters in here uh, for the soldering, but uh, it did escape um, a little bit. So just interesting note there. Dang, that is interesting. Let's go to, is it Amy? Yeah, hi. I didn't want to interrupt the flow, but when we were talking about the sources of the pollutants, um, I didn't hear you mention um, landscaping equipment, um, specifically like the two-stroke motors and stuff like that, which I know is a significant source. Yeah, and I understand that the Air Resources Board is phasing those out, correct? 2020-something? Um, I don't remember the exact year. I'm sure Carb 20, can tell me. 2025. 2025. Yeah. Uh, yeah, any comments, any other comments on the handheld equipment piece? It'd be interesting to, to do some monitoring around that. I just have a quick comment about the building decarbonization movement, about getting gas out of our houses and a whole lot of other things. Uh, State of California spends a lot of money on all sorts of stuff, and they have something uh, being planned right now called the 2022 Scoping Plan, where they they really direct a lot of money in California. It's an, it's an economy-wide plan, and uh, some of us are of the opinion that, um, you know, uh, small scale strategies like helping people replace the appliances in their homes are not getting enough attention. Uh, it's a lot easier to invest at an industrial level and to buy new expensive equipment for rich companies that should buy their own stuff and than it is to like go door to door and help folks like you at a granular level replace the appliances in your home. And so there's, there's lots of public opportunities to get involved in, in that process. Uh, with the scoping plan. I'd be happy to share stuff with you, Adrian, that you can send out. That you can Dave, send out. It looks like Dave has a response to that. Dave, I'm muting you because uh, you had a yeah. double something going on. Um, you're good. So so you, I'm going to give you the last word on this, and then we're going to go to the to uh, Pristina with the next uh, breakout, okay? 
Yeah, um, so I, I just wanted to say, uh, sort of, uh, you know, following up on what Matt said, is that SMUD is actually uh, doing a lot of work with folks, uh, in, including the Air Quality District, on figuring out how to incentivize lawn equipment to uh, to convert from uh, gas to electric, but also to, we're, we're going to be focused, we have existing rebate programs to get people to switch from gas, indoor gas appliances to electric. Uh, and then also we, we want to focus our efforts on, um, on disadvantaged communities because we understand that people, uh, a, a lot of people, even if it's a rebate, they still need more help to, to make conversions. So uh, I, I totally agree, Matt, that there needs to be a lot of focus on helping people who really need the help and not just uh, people who are doing it, uh, you know, who, who could afford to do it on their own. So um, that, that's where we're hoping to, to focus. Well, that's where we are focusing our efforts. Thanks. Thank you. So let's, uh, let's go over to Pristina with Civic Thread, who'll report out for the, the, the biggest group, which was the education and, and, and engagement group. Go for it. Yeah, uh, thanks for transitioning over to me, Adrian. Um, not a part of number breakout room number two. I just put something about candle use uh, for those candle users that can't give them up. Like, unfortunately, myself, uh, there's a way to responsibly light candles uh, to at least help a little bit with the. Um, I can I share screen. I wanted to just quickly share out from um, what our team was working on. Um, hope you can see. Yes. Um, so we had education advocacy um, facilitated by Jordan um, with support of myself, um, as you can see here. Uh, so what we really covered, uh, we went over those videos um, from our snack playlist, um, giving kind of a foundational overview about air quality um, education, and then uh, working with the group to really use bulk of that time to brainstorm on ways that we can advocate um, to activate ourselves and our neighbors. Um, so the way that we did that we started off with a question to figure out um, why community education and advocacy was important to those in the room. And it was really to just start those juices flowing for the brainstorm. A lot of uh, pieces shared about how education is power. Education is awareness. It's a way for us to, um, you know, take back that power. And um, I, I think I'm echoing um, and encouraging people to really advocate for themselves and to, uh, really understand what's going on around them. Um, so how we started out this brainstorm uh, was to first think about, well, what efforts of advocacy and education really work for our community members, for myself, for my neighbors. And then we had a really beautiful brainstorm. I don't think these sticky notes even uh, captured all the great messages we were getting in the chat box, but this is really a summary of the kind of comments we were getting. And through that, we were able to prioritize to four different avenues um, of efforts that people could do. And these numbers that you see here, as we were uh, grouping things up, we were able to do a vote community-based engagement one. Um, and we do want to make note that a lot of these um, categories are interchangeable, but for the sake of um, this breakout room, we did focus on just, um, specifically uh, creating a community event and how to proceed with doing, doing such. Um, we were able to break it down into uh, different things we wanted to address, um, such as key messaging, uh, target identifying your target audience, being really specific about that, um, what kind of platforms are available to us that we should be using to do that outreach to get to the type of audience that we're hoping to attract, and then what kind of networks that are around us um, that we can leverage. And then uh, continuing that on, we also spent a bit of time uh, talking about what's in a, a desirable time when planning a community event and what goals we hope to achieve and how do we measure that if we've met our goals. Um, and then types of roles that we would want to um, get people involved in to make sure that our community event um, was a success. And so after that, uh, did share some resources and things that people can do now, because I feel like after we end this event, there's going to be a lot of momentum about what we can do to take um, power back and uh, being control of our uh, I guess more local air quality. So we shared some resources on long-term salute, um, long-term long-term actions, um, and things that we can do today. 
And then we do have this pledge and we can share that out via email to everyone if they're interested, but we just thought that it would be a fun way um, to pledge, do some um, spreading awareness to the people in our personal networks that are not here today, utilizing our hashtag, our air, our voice. Um, this is pretty easy to add to um, Facebook and Instagram stories, but I digress. I do want to turn it over to the people in our breakout room number two, if you had, if you wanted to share any takeaways um, or what you got out of our breakout room. Yeah, you had a lot of folks in your breakout room. <laughs> a lot there. Well, I'll, I'll just try to kick off discussion in that I heard, I heard a lot of people who, who know how to like connect with their own community already. That, they, that they've been involved in lots of different strategies around hosting events and campaigns. And I think, you know, those are all powerful lessons that will accelerate work around air quality. Um, you know, you got a pretty integrated community from the sound of it. Um, that's an asset. And turning it to this fight should be pretty exciting. Yeah, maybe question for the civic thread team is which of those see it seemed like the biggest surprise to you because you guys are pro really good outreach engagement facilitation folks i'm um, just wondering kind of what maybe what excited you about about the ideas uh, that came from community members or what was what surprised you i can uh take a stab at answering that and jordan feel free to chime in um we had a lot of great um ideas especially around networks to leverage. Um, there seems to be, I think Matt kind of touched on this a little bit, uh, but just a lot of uh, um, like already connectivity going on in the community members. Um, people were mentioning um, religious organizations, spe um, specifying places like um, 350, social justice, SAC, etc. cetera. Um, identifying public libraries, identifying small businesses. And that, I think that was, that's really the key here uh, when we're trying to build and outreach the community. It's like, who do you know? I think that's a really important piece um, when you're doing outreach. Who do you have that's trusted in your network that can push out that message and really amplify the people that you're reaching or just amplify your messaging in general? So it was really cool to see that that's already Everyone has that in their arsenal already. It's now just how do we mobilize with that? Yeah, I think um, Christina took the words right out of my mouth. Um, it, it was really cool. We we started at the beginning kind of asking people to share off mute or in the chat um, what unique skills they're bringing to the table, what experiences they have, perspectives, connections. And I was blown away by who we have here today. And our hope is that this can also be a networking event of sorts. Um, hopefully you're meeting people in these breakout rooms um, that you didn't know previously that might be able to tap into a group that you uh, previously didn't have access to. Um, and as Adrian shared in the beginning, there's going to be a snack 2.0. This conversation is going to continue and we hope that um, everyone here continues to be a, a part of that conversation because you all have such amazing um, connections. You're all active and embedded members of your community and have so much to contribute to this. And I just so definitely our hope moving forward. Definitely in agreement with Jordan. I just wanted to end um, the last thing that I wanted to share out. Um, I just want to express gratitude on behalf of Jordan and I, this is like the thread team, um, for how interactive our group was. Um, we did have a good amount of people um, joining us, but I hope we were able to capture all of your feedback. It was incredibly enlightening. It's always the best thing to hear directly from the, the mouths of the community members and your personal experiences. And then I also want to express gratitude um, for the vulnerability in that room and being able to trust one another so quickly and share. Um, not so easy to share stories and, um, you know, I hope you see that as a collective, how much um, we possibly could have a shared experience and that we do have a desired um, goal together. And that's what we're all here for. So just wanted to say thank you again. Thank you. Any other thoughts on, on that breakout? Anything else that emerged? I'm curious to hear from anyone in our breakout if they are interested in um, kind of 
uh, implementing any of the ideas that came out of our session today. I know we had a very vocal group, so I hope some people feel comfortable sharing in the chat or off mute. No problem. <laughs> well, we were able to capture that, of course. And I really liked how you guys were able to visualize it and share it. Um, well, let's move on to our third group then. Uh, who, who would like to present on behalf of uh, Data? Alan, you yeah. want to take it away? Yeah, I'll start. I'll start. Okay, yeah. Don't let anybody pull it. Okay. So um, I think, um, honestly, uh, Sherry kind of stole the show uh, with the demonstration of uh, the data of, the, uh, of what they've put in Richmond. And so I think that there are were two main takeaways uh, from our thing. And number one is, is that um, I think that just based off of the response and the discussion around the visualization, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, but I just, yeah, what, what Sherry put together. Um, I think that it's definitely a tool that would be, I think that there's definitely some value in building up forward here. Um, just, yeah, just, just purely by the response and things like that. Um, and then, uh, and then in the second part, because the first, the first half was really just dedicated towards that. Um, it was also kind of talking about um, kind of the narrative and communicating what we're communicating with the data, because you know, data is a word that I'm getting tired of saying in the past uh, hour or two. But, um, but really, it's, it's, it's. We we tend to think of sometimes we can think of data as, as an absolute thing, but it's also just to be thinking about. Uh, the story that we're telling. I think we had a couple of people speak up and just be really honest about, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, and so I think that the um, definitely the visualization is something that'll be helpful. Um, and I think we also talked a lot about uh, like the wildfire, you know, kind of how do we like, because like, one of the things that I remarked was is that I'm from Illinois. And so I had to get used to the fact that the sky turns orange out here sometimes. But with wildfires being such a big part of the, of the culture out here, you know, there's already a basis to kind of talk about air quality and things like that. So as we're thinking about ways to move this narrative forward, um, you know, we can kind of build up off of, you know, some of the, some of the uh, uh, big word, which I'm forgetting, uh, that we have around uh, air quality and start thinking about how can we use that to start thinking about this on like more of the community and a local level, but definitely keeping how we communicate this. Not only are we transmitting the data, but are we saying it in a way where people can be heard and they're understanding what we're saying? Yeah, and I'll also just add that um, there was a lot of conversation and rightfully so about like the lack of understanding of the data, which I think folks on the project team are, are acutely aware of, um, especially those of us that don't identify as data experts. And so really needing to find a way to break that data down into a way that everyday people can understand. And when I mean everyday people, I'm talking about myself included <laughs> um, because the data, it, it's, it's not straightforward, at least to me. And, and I know that can be a barrier to even going to look at the map and trying to figure out what does it mean. And so I think there is um, a really great, really great need in kind of breaking it down into something that people can understand. And, and I know that's a task that we've all been working on, yeah. but I think it was ground truth today. Yeah. Um, the other thing similar to what Alan was sharing is that, uh, and one key takeaway that I got from Sherry was that, um, you know, we have the tools in Sacramento to do something very similar to what they've done in Richmond. And, and I really appreciate Sherry coming out and sharing more about um, the project that they worked on because, it provides some in inspiration for what we can do, right? And so looking at the way they've been able to model that data um, and knowing that they were just it, it, essentially just pulling um, pulling data from, from different sources. And so like we have the Clarity monitors, we know there's Purple Air monitors, we know United Latinos has monitors in South Sacramento. And, and we also know that, you know, we have regulatory monitors and we could potentially um, pull that data to do a similar modeling that, that they're doing in Richmond, which I think is one step uh, closer to presenting the data in a way that makes sense for, for folks who aren't data experts. So really appreciate the conversation that happened, all of the great questions, um, all of the momentum and people who want to stay involved and continue to stay involved in this process. And I'd also just like to open it up to anyone who was in that breakout room to share more about um, what they learned or, or uh, you know, how, what their key takeaways were from the, from the breakout. 
Oh, I also do want to uh, just say, the, the I mean, the one pager, I mean, it's definitely a, a good start. So kind of developing stuff like that to kind of, because I'm laying it over the map with the AQI and things like that. So I think more things in that direction. Yep. Anyway. Anyone from our group want to share? I'll just have one key um, thing that um, I expressed was uh, making sure, and I think you had mentioned, Kara, this was true in your other input sessions making sure the data is used uh, not to um, not to sanction or impugn folks that are polluters, but how can we bring resources uh, for the mitigations? And how are we gonna use the data? Because you know, if the answer is the numbers just make us shut in more, how can the numbers make us have communities that thrive? Um, instead of all, all of us just being having information to stay inside. So, um, so as long as the data is paired with practices and policies and programs to support mitigation efforts and um, you know, planting more trees was one of those suggestions and where to plant them um, you know, was some of the things offered. Um, that's just something that I expressed. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for elevating that here, Brenda. And and I did share in the breakout room that this this has come up in previous conversations, um, and particularly during our uh, neighborhood coalition meetings. And you know, we we do have Snack 2.0, and we do have an element of participatory budgeting, right? So, depending on what the community says, uh, we we could certainly be taking a look at you know some of these small businesses and helping support them um, get into re be regulatory, right? Make sure that they're on this right track and that, um, you know, we're not saying, oh, you're a polluter and, you know, we, we, we don't want you here, but like, how can we bring them along and make sure that we're bringing up folks in the community with us? So that's absolutely something that um, we're acutely aware of and that we will continue to work on in SNAP 2.0. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, you know, some of the strategies that Dave was saying that SMUD has incentives for electrification of lawn care equipment um, and I was really, really um, heartened by the opening video during lunch of the youth that spoke on behalf of Northgate Garden Land and really, you know, elevated that corridor and, and the Latino population here in South Natomas. Um, you know, could we envision a, a, a similar to Green Tech's mobility hub a business, a new type of business, if we shut one of these tire shops down and instead converted it, worked with the owners to a place where day laborers and and uh, landscapers could come and pick up their, you know, their electric blowers and mowers, you know, and rent them on daily or weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And they would be charged there with solar panels on the top. Or, you know, I just, I'm so excited for all, all the work that, um, everyone is doing on, on these issues. And I just hope that we can get to, you know, to solutions that just don't have us all shutting in all the time. Okay, I was in on that group too. And I, I just want to share that some of the data that I've learned over the last couple of years hasn't came from our air monitors, you know? And so we have the medical data, we have the asthma rate data, we have a uh, I found out uh, the cancer clusters. So the AB 617 community in South Sacramento was selected first, but North Sacramento was really the worst uh, community as far as Cal and viral screen. But uh, the South Sacramento community did have the largest cancer cluster in it. And that's off of Gerber Road. And so there's interesting facts in, in all the different data that's available to us. And incorporating that with our air monitor data is gonna be really informative and really powerful. One other stat, uh, and if I have it correctly, pocket area has the lowest life expectancy. Who knew that? You know, it's such a nice area. But those are the that's the different data we can collect and, and use along with our air monitors to uh, help get this discussion understood in an impactful way where it, it, people understand it. You know, by the zip code. So just just one food for that. Thank you. Looks like Matt has his hand raised, and if folks want to provide comments, please raise your hand. 
Yeah, I just wanted to re respond to something that I think it was Brenda was saying about, you know, how do we not just collect a bunch of data that makes everybody stay indoors all day long? Right. Uh, because because that's the way the public agencies are handling this, right? They're doing a big 50 kilometer grid or a one kilometer grid and they say the air is bad and they send you a text message uh, if, if you've even know about that service and have signed up for it. Uh, and so what's your choice, you know, to hide inside all day or to live your life? And you, you normalize that pollution because it's not, it's not specific. It's not specific to your neighborhood and it's not specific to time of day, but you all know that the air changes over the course of the day, that we live in an air shed that's dynamic as temperatures change through the day and you start to pull some water in off of the Delta, some air in off of the Delta in the Bay. Um, we, we have dramatic shifts in air quality here in Stockton. And so one of the things you can do with your hyper-local monitoring that has real-time data is you can not only tell people, hey, it's a bad air day, don't have recess, close your windows. You can also tell people air quality has improved. Go about your business. You can issue an all clear and nobody else does that. And so the fact that you don't get that all clear just leads people to be like, man, I got a bunch of bad news, but I still got to live my life. So they, they dismiss the data entirely because it's not practical to hide inside all day long. So uh, you guys are a part of really a movement that, that I think is changing the way we're gonna use air quality data. Um, Cause it, you know, it's not always bad out. There are times when you could go out and if you are a sensitive person with a compromised respiratory system, you could decide to take your walk to the grocery store at the right time of day instead of the wrong time of day. Oh, and then the other one about trees, you see the tree behind me. Uh, yeah, not all trees are created equal. You could plant a tree by your house and yeah, that's important. It'll shade your house and drop your energy bill uh, and protect you from heat in the summer. Uh, but your Sacramento and, and this neighborhood from the looks of it doesn't look crazy industrial. You know, not like, not like my neighborhood in South Stockton that's just crazy industrial. So we have like major stationary sources of pollution. Um, but you like us, you know, I'll, I'll bet my pinky, your largest source of pollution is transportation. It's the freeways and the highways that are gutting your community and not other people's communities. Uh, and so there's, there's a forestry strategy called a vegetative barrier. And there's a lot of emerging science around this. There are best practices around this. So tall, dense plantings of trees near the freeway knock down lots of air particulate. Whereas, you know, you get a half mile away from the freeway, you're reducing particulate by maybe 10, maybe 12%. But if you have a well-designed proximal installation of trees next to the freeway, you can reduce pollute, di the dispersion of that uh, tailpipe pollution by up to 60%. And so this is where you start to learn the real terrible things about how our governments don't work together, right? Caltrans is polluting your community. The city doesn't want to maintain Caltrans right away. City's already mad at Caltrans because their right away is full of all the unsheltered people that we got out there. Um, but the truth is we need to overcome that inertia. We need to occupy that space near these freeways because these, freeway, these freeways are killing us. Um, and those places need to be redesigned and buffered and, and furnished with these amenities that protect our homes. So this uh, forestry is, is, it's always a good time to plant a tree. 20 years ago was a better time and planting it next to the freeway is a better place to put it. 100% Matt. And, and I just wanna shout out the, the Clean California program at the state. This is a relatively new program. It actually has millions of dollars for uh, things like tree plantings by highways. Again, there's a whole lot of logistical stuff that I don't even, can't even imagine, I'm sure associated with getting, getting water to some of these highway, <laughs> near, near highways, and, and of course, maintaining trees once they're planted. But you know, there is some funding available for that. So just noting that. Um, any other thoughts on the data side of things? Chiquita, go for it. Hey, Chiquita? Yeah, hey. go for it. All right, let me, let me pronounce my name for you. It's Chiquita. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're talking here, all of us. What up? What up? Green Tech here. And you were saying about planting trees by the freeways. I would love that. Uh, but would it be equitable if we're not getting, if every community or, or a region is not getting serviced? 
on that level of where it would be high risk if trees are not getting enough water in California. And then people who are micro transiting, you know, you have trees falling on the actual freeways, you know, which can be a hazard. Yeah, they so won't let you we do need that. to make sure we yeah. need to make sure that we are getting community members and service representatives to get out there and make sure our trees are being watered. There are some parks that have hazard trees. I see them all the time. They're dead. And yeah. while I was working out doing step aerobics, I seen dead trees and I didn't say anything. And then I was like, man, that tree's about to fall any minute. And then we were working out and the tree fell down and we were under the tree. Yep. Because those trees, that park is not being serviced. Well, yeah, there's a there's a whole there's a whole nexus of species selection and age of neighborhood. I'll just say that um, I hope you all know how lucky you are in Sacramento to have such a comprehensive urban tree canopy compared to cities like Richmond and Stockton, where I've done my work. Um, you can take a 1930s racist housing map, and the modern day satellite scan of tree canopy is identical. Where they decided to put black families are where there are no trees today. And so absolutely maintenance is being handled uh, inequitably all across the state and absolutely within our cities. Um, Sacramento had a, you know, has had a good 20, 30 years of community leadership involved in its forestry. Uh, but, you know, you're right, Shaquita, no, nobody's going to take care of it but the community. And so it's about brokering these community urban forestry programs with our cities, with our counties, and with Caltrans if we're going to address these, these freeway problems. And I'll just say it's a, it's kind of a new day at Caltrans. They have a, a very forward-looking secretary for the first time in a very long time, um, and they're taking this issue seriously because, uh, you know, it's a categorical fact that freeways were put through poor people's neighborhoods. Uh, okay. our, story, our story in Stockton, they they put a freeway where nobody needed one just to get the Filipinos, the Chinese, the African-American and the Japanese and Italians out of downtown. We cut off gotcha. our nose to spite our face and our city has never recovered from that. So, so it sounds like to make it more equitable, maybe in those communities, Caltrans needs to hire people. They got a bunch of money to spray over graffiti. Maybe they got a little bit of money to water some trees. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, the most racist architecture in California are the freeways, hands down, next to the prisons. Mm. Okay. Thanks for well, that. Well, let's all write Caltrans and say, hey, we need more service reps to water the trees. Let's hire some people. Yeah. We've got a letter template, letter writing template for that. So uh, let us know if you, if you want one. Yeah. Absolutely. We just had a career fair yesterday in Oak Park. Yeah, and these, are jobs, these are jobs that can't go anywhere else, right? You can't call in tree maintenance from India, right? I mean, this can't be outsourced. Uh, the, the, tech, the tech weirdos from Silicon Valley can't do this from a satellite. Somebody in the neighborhood's got to get paid to take care of it. Or maybe we can do it by satellite. Let's write that down. Write that down really quickly. You, 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 have you, actually, can, you actually can assess risk and, and prioritize maintenance needs from satellite and also from Google Street View and from some machine learning oh. platforms. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's like the old say, the old adage, the best fertilizer is a farmer's feet. The mm -hmm. best forest is, a fo is, is the one that has a forester in it. Gotcha. Love it. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation, and 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 we're we're about to switch over to Niall to see how he's been doing with uh with his his hardware hacking. Really excited to see all what that's been how that's been going. Um, but just want to you know so so we'll we'll hear from Niall, and then we're gonna hear from our keynote speaker, and then talk next steps. But really, just want to thank you all for your participation today. Um, you know, the reason where we could be having this conversation and building community power, regardless of whether funding, regardless of whether this big program existed at the state level to, to make things easier, you know, we could still be doing this, whether or not we have a program. So just want to appreciate you all for, for making time today. I think we're lucky that we do have this AB 617 program at the state level to, to work with the state, to take advantage of their funding, take advantage of their regulatory authority to move this stuff forward but happy we're having the conversation nonetheless. So with that,
Um, Niall, take it away and I'll make you a, a featured featured person so everybody can see what you're doing. Fantastic. I love being featured. Um, so uh, in true spirit of electronics, uh, quick hacking, uh, catastrophe has occurred, but we can learn from this. So we will look at it. Let me switch over to the microscope view. Um, so any of you who are familiar with electronics will probably know what the term <laughs> releasing the magic smoke is. I heard Alan chuckling in the background. Um, so yeah, this, this little, uh, this little linear I see is, uh, nice and cooked. Um, so what did I do to get here? Um, so we started with, oh, let's see if I can bring this up. We started with a little Arduino sketch whose goal was entirely to take serial data from a little microcontroller. Um, and I think I can actually show that here. Uh, it's off the screen, but it's right here. Take information off that little microcontroller and relay it to that little board. Um, and so we connected it and we noticed that, I'm saying we, but I mean me, we noticed that uh, the goal of the part of it, part of the microcontroller's job was to enable power before taking readings from the sensor. Um, and we got, because of my haphazardness with creating the wiring earlier, I had a 12 volt line and a five volt line that were a little too close to each other. And they touched, bridged over and now I have lost this little component. Um, so uh, now comes the job of, you know, the next phase in, you know, if, if I was doing this long-term, it wouldn't be uh, give up now, it's identify this component. Um, and so looking at this, we can see, you can see that little bulge on it. Um, I think I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, so you can actually kind of see it cracked a little bit. And so what happened here is 12 volts went into one of these pins that should have been uh, five volts. Uh, so if we put this under, actually I have to zoom back out in order to get the knob, a little probe underneath there. So we, I looked at this little case code, right? And with components this small, they don't have enough space on them to write down, sorry, to write down the uh, actual model number, the component number for what it is. So all we got is this XA8NB uh, label on that. Um, and so take that, go into the, uh, the internet ways and try to figure out what that is. And luckily or unluckily, it's some no-name component from uh, a Russian manufacturer um, and accessing the Russian internet right now is kind of tricky um, given current events. Um, so I did find what I think is a very similar uh, device over, we can switch back to whiteboard view here. Um, that looks like it from a Chinese distributor. So this is a regulator that's responsible for taking in five volts uh, from the main power line and dropping it down to like 1.3 volts. Um, and so next phase is now finding this little component, ordering it, and then resoldering it onto this board. So that's where I am with that. Uh, but these are still, these are still fun little projects to mess around with. How much do you think one of those little components costs? Oh, nothing like 68 cents or something. They're okay. there. Yeah, no, the, the, so the nice thing about components and working with electronics is most of the parts are dirt cheap. It's more of a matter of finding them and getting them ordered. Um, we're in a situation right now where uh, globalization has made us reliant on ordering parts from uh, various different corners of the globe. Everybody makes them, but getting them here is going to be the issue. So it's like a, it's like a, under $1 part that's probably gonna cost $12 in shipping um, and probably take like a few days to get here. So that's where we're at with that. You buy bulk, right? And so that is that is kind of the approach to it. Usually when I do buy components, I buy more than one. I'll buy like, you know, 30 because it doesn't make sense to get just one of them. Um, and if anybody is uh, 
aware of other local current events regarding, you know, uh, the chip shortage, right, that has been out there. Uh, this is another one of those situations that gets effect affected by that, where you have a component, you know what it is, you've done your whole board design around this, and trying to find a trying to find uh, an alternative to this is kind of tricky. So we'll see how that works. Very cool. Thank you, Niall. No problem. Does anyone have questions for Niall? So many. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Hey, I'm, I'm like, I, I'm more, I, I enjoy discussing, you know, how these things work with other people. So shoot, what do you got? I would definitely eat up the clock. Um, if I could ask you all the questions that I'd like, but I'll tell you there, there's, so there's one application that I'm struggling with mm. and you guys seem to be chewing on it too, which is, um, the data, the data transmission is a weakness in community air monitoring strategy. Mm. So, you know, with, uh, not with clarity, cause it's really about that cell subscription, but with like purple air, you could do an SD card if you didn't have access to. Um, Wi-Fi, and you could go out and pull down the data, and then you could go back, you could upload it, and it could be time synchronized. Um, but, you know, who wants that, right? You want to be able to see the data in real time so you can tell people what's going on outside in the here and now. And I will tell you, clarity is worth the money because of how quickly you can deploy it. Purple Air is, I think, a better sensor. It's got dual sensors, and it shuts down the data feed when one of them drops out. It's also been tested more broadly. It's, it's all over the country by the tens of thousands. Um, they've, they've come in really consistent, consistently with federal reference grade monitors, but getting into somebody's home, uh, securing power, and then getting Wi-Fi access and then maintaining that connection is a headache. It is such a headache. Um, and I got to put up 150 of these for UC Merced. And so one of the salute ch challenges I'm looking at, Niles, is, uh, you know, setting up maybe some Wi-Fi hubs where I know I have a reliable signal with good bandwidth and then finding a way to hack in some sort of a low frequency radio signal that allows mm -hmm. me to maybe reach a half mile or even two miles down the road, especially into rural places. Uh, and so looking at, I've been looking at strategies for, for hacking in a low, low frequency wireless radio signal. Uh, into any of these things because they're, they're, you know, not everybody has Wi-Fi, not everybody wants to share their Wi-Fi with you, and, you know, over great landscapes, um, Wi-Fi is, is a real restriction. So I don't know if, if, if you've ever, if you've ever worked on any of those uh, local radio frequency things. So I'm not so much a ham, but I have a lot of ham friends, and I've done uh -huh. a lot of RF things. Um, and for ham is ham radio operators for anybody who's, who's in the in the know those are um, dangerous friends right yeah uh, i think one advantage you have especially with being near you said you see merced yeah, well they they're they're part of the contract with the department of justice for all of this got okay. you um is that like if the issue is really connectivity that is luckily one of the areas where and i was trying to pull up another device um where getting different particle.io that's where it is um, getting different network connection options, whether it is, I mean, we say radio and we're referring to like low frequency radio, but really yeah. Wi-Fi is radio too. Cell network is radio yep. too. They're all just radio on different frequencies. There are a giant pile of low cost solutions out there. Um, one of them that I was bringing up right now was, uh, particle. Um, they have cell network connected small devices on really, really tiny da data plans, like really low cost. Um, and much in the same way as I was going to hook up an Arduino to talk to this thing, if you know, if there is a data interface between the two devices, right, that's meant for a regular computer, you can pull that data onto one of these little devices, right? Um, another common technology that's emerging is LoRa, um, which is a, uh, a low bandwidth, uh, but high range uh, radio uh, communication protocol that's meant for some networking in outdoor situations like this. Um, and so those are all off the shelf devices that, you know, in Purple Air, I haven't messed around with them a little bit. So I was going to look at that right now. I can get an off the shelf low red device that'll strap to something like a Raspberry Pi, which is $10, right? Mm -hmm. For the cheaper ones. And that's got USB host capability. It's running Linux. It's running a full operating system. If that can communicate with this device and pull information from it, then Shazam, a couple, you, you know, little bash scripts later and you have a device that is pulling the data and sending it someplace else. 
Um, and when you have, you know, uh, one one thing that I, I would like to see more, especially universities or people adjacent to universities take advantage of is if you have, uh, you know, a computer engineering department or computer science department, there are students there who could easily do this for a senior design project. Like it's nothing to, if, you know, you have the sensor that's already there, right? The, 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 the science of taking the measurement is already taken care of, then you're just, you know, really struggling with doing a little bit of web de development to have an API, right? To have an endpoint, to have a server that can capture the data and then display it in a good method. Um, take advantage of some of the, you know, undergrads to, to you know, slap together a, a, a Band-Aid for making that happen. Yeah, for sure. Definitely looking at that. I want to share something with you. Our friends in Germany have pulled together really a massive citizen science project mm -hmm. called sensor.io, whatever they call it. I um, mean, it's basically a Raspberry Pi reverse engineered mm -hmm. uh, do-it-yourself device. And you can build them for like 35 bucks. Um, or if you're good at it and you buy in bulk, you can build them for a lot less. And they 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 freely maintain that map there mm. for everybody in the world. And it's underutilized here in the United States. And I've, I've always wanted to get to a place where every school I'm working with are building these things, taking them home, monitoring their indoor and outdoor air quality, and just surfacing, you know, oodles of data so that then we can chew on it with the right kind of machine learning stuff but um I, you know i'm a grumpy history teacher so <laughs> I, I run i run into kind of dead ends with some of this stuff um, and, but you will swim in those in those waters and and definitely I, I want to encourage especially with more universities opening makerspace style spaces um you know if if uh, if a you know, grant has been acquired to do, to buy some devices, uh, grab a couple extra, throw them at the makers and just let them break them, right? Like yeah. what happened today is something that, you know, when when y'all gave me the sensor, I wanted to make sure it's okay. It's like, hey, I might fry this thing and it might never work again. Like, I want you to be aware of that. Um, but if you have a couple extra of them, you know, especially with somebody like Clarity who it's selling the hardware for cheap or giving it away, it's worth trying this. And this is not an unrecoverable error. Unrecoverable error. This is an error that's going to require shipping time. And so, yeah. Thank you for that, Niall. Um, <laughs> Earl, Earl, I, I, make, I, I have a question short. for both uh, uh, Matt and Niall. Um, can a, a community Wi-Fi system, as has been historically proposed for target cities by Google, Verizon, et cetera. Um, it, would that work to enable Purple Airs to communicate and download data um, at residents that, that don't have Wi-Fi capability? That's a hope. And I'm trying to, you know, kick up conversations right now with um, Verizon uh, about that very challenge. Um, you know, the, the bandwidth for these sensors is negligible. You know, it's something that they could share and they actually do have a public benefits program uh, for, for hooking people into these wireless signals that are all around us. Like we're awash in data. Uh, um, we just, you know, they just control all of the access points. So absolutely, Earl, it's just a matter of uh, getting that, you know, we're, we're still kind of in a framework where the public designed all of this technology and then handed it over to private entities who then slow drip it back to us for as long as they can to make as much money possible off of it. It, it, it seems to me, because there has been um, and, uh, work done by the city of Sacramento in years past to, to roll out something like this, the, but if we can focus that a renewed effort to do this in disadvantaged communities where, where a large fraction of households don't have internet connection, we can not only help serve the purpose of, of, of communicating uh, air quality levels, we can provide Wi-Fi for residents that are, are truly in need, yeah. it seems to me. Earl, there's a lot of people who have uh, a huge interest in denying you that beautiful vision. So internet access should be a Title II utility like your telephone yeah. that everyone has a right to, because as we all know, you really can't exist in today's society without yeah. being able to interact with you got it. cyber facilities of our life. And they, no matter who's in the White House, they seem to be really malleable to the telecom lobby that wants to keep us all paying every day to download bits. Um, 
Well, the, but 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 there's in California there's state dollars to to sure. improve air quality. Let's match a couple needs of communities like air quality monitoring and Wi-Fi access for educational purposes, and see if we can't leverage something here oh, in Sacramento. Absolutely. It, you know, ignoring the federal government and and their problems. Well, one quick thing I want to add to that is um, typically I, I I'm approach things from less from a policy point of view and from a the hacker mentality like what can i do right now that's not gonna you know that i don't have to wait for somebody else to allow me to do mm -hmm. um and i do know that uh one of the right exactly um the different uh, uh isps out there who rent you your at home you know wi-fi box um they actually host uh public not so much public but any you know an example would be xfinity there's a you might have noticed there's a separate xfinity wi-fi being yep. broadcast from your device and technically anybody who has an xfinity account can connect to that um and so you could they're they're essentially running a whole different ssid a whole different network on your device without asking you permission explicitly so that kind of stuff is out there to some extent um but i will say that you know i think I do like, you know, the, the avenue Matt was, uh, right, yeah, Matt was going down previously where um, I do like trying to find ways to get it off of the public Wi-Fi. Public Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi in general is a great way to just kind of get it working, um, but having something that is truly, that will truly work over a wider range, uh, like, you know, LoRa or uh, Cell Network, right? people kind of take it back from cell network because you, you feels like you have to pay a subscription, but for industrial customers who are, you know, if you're going to buy a couple hundred of these things, the data plans get negligible and they'll give you, a, you know, a, a couple of years ago, we, we did a little hackathon with AT&T where they gave us a whole bunch of uh, 4G connected microcontroller modems and said, hey, do what you want with them. And looking at the prices, it to keep going after they cut us off was going to be pennies a month. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that's not unique to any one person. It's totally doable. Um, it's if you buy something like uh, like Clarity and the advantage of Clarity is you need absolutely zero technical skill to get that set up. Like my, Matt was saying before, you plug it in and it works. And the more you want something to just go without you thinking about it, the more you're going to be paying for it. Uh, and so the more you can offset that with the, the other side of that is weirdo hackers like me who don't buy any of that stuff. I don't want a smart TV. I don't want any of that because I will make it all work. I will control it. I will do it myself. Um, and if a spider crawls inside of it, I will hunt that spider down and I will squash that spider because I'm comfortable with doing that. But it's the, yeah, it's the, the I'm technical enough to handle it myself versus I don't want to think about it. I just want it to work. Spectrum, uh, gradient, and clarity is clearly on one side of it and they do a good job with that. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you for that. So... This was wonderful. I'm going to turn it over now to our, our keynote speaker, Matt Holmes. I know we ate a, a little bit into your time, Matt, but please uh, uh, really appreciate you being here and, and would love if you could just kind of contextualize this program w within what we've been talking about today and working yeah. on today. Yeah, that's cool. I kind of ate into it too, but I'm just so geeked out to meet allies in this, um, this awful fight that we're all stuck in that we didn't know we were losing, or at least I didn't. Uh, so I'll just try to go through really quickly into how I got here. Um, I was a park ranger. I was a U.S. history teacher focused on Indian white relations. I really appreciated the land acknowledgement at the beginning of this. And I really appreciate the, um, the anti-racist framing of the whole day. You know, power is distributed asymmetrically. Uh, melanin challenged people like myself need to get better at growing up about that and owning that discomfort and pushing that forward in policy conversations. Uh, so it's nice to see that um, we're finding more and more communities where we can be frank about the really rotten history that got us here. Um, but my, it was my work as a park ranger working on history work in Richmond, California, that got me into air quality work. I was trying to, you know, get young people of color to care about the National Park Service and go into the outdoors. So I did a lot of outdoor activity and camping programs. And one day I was trying to go for a ride on the Richmond Greenway. And our metal recycler caught on fire. And there was all sorts of terrible airborne heavy metals and you name it, volatile organic compounds, toxic organic gases. It was a disaster. Uh, and I realized that day that, you know, no one can responsibly be active outdoors, especially in low income communities of color because they are overburdened with these um, potential risks. And then there's the routine risks of freeway traffic. So started doing little, um, uh, air monitors on our hip from somebody called uh, Habitat Map. 
and just trying to raise people's awareness around routine air, air quality pollution. And then AB 617 came around. And so that little bit of history complaining about the air made us qualified to be one of the initial grantees in AB 617. We were a community air grantee, much like Valley Vision. Uh, and my idea was to instrument my city and highlight the, the equally disastrous impacts of freeway pollution because in Richmond, everybody's got one bad guy and it's the Chevron refinery. And everybody points to Chevron and thinks all of the, their problems are Chevrons. And I sort of naively assumed that a giant facility like Chevron was really uh, monitored and instrumented in a meaningful way. I, I would learn later that it is not. In fact, no industry really is. Um, but what was different about my community air grant was that it was, it was landed on me at the same time as the AB 617 blueprint community process. And these are these 17 communities that Adrian told us about earlier. Uh, these are 17 communities that have uh, unacceptable mortality rates and negative public health outcomes. And they have chronically had those outcomes for decades. And the reason why the, those, those communities got identified was that a number of us uh, back in the set, back in 2016, 17 and 18, we're raising real questions around the cap and trade program and the greenhouse gas reduction fund. Um, for those of you that, that don't know, you know, California has implemented a, a pay to play scheme for the fossil fuel industry and major emitters of carbon. And if you emit enough of that, you have to pay into a fund uh, to offset your impact. And that pile of money was getting spent in a lot of different funny ways. You know, um, the greenhouse gas reduction fund bought brand new refrigerators for Whole Foods in Sebastopol. And we felt like that was ridiculous and that public money uh, shouldn't be used to uh, further spread the gap between a wealthy community and the rest of us. Uh, we felt like 100% of the greenhouse gas reduction fund should be used in disadvantaged communities and overly overburdened communities. Um, and so we were actually questioning whether or not cap and trade should continue since it seemed to be continuing pollution in our communities. And uh, we, we threatened that program and it, and it, it kind of came down to a close vote in the state assembly and the state uh, Senate. Uh, and so AB 617 was offered up as a, as a solution to that problem. Okay, nobody in California wants to let go of this new funny money, right? It inflated all of the agencies, they, they got to fund urban and community forestry programs through CAL FIRE, urban greening programs through the California Natural Resource Agency. Um, and so they didn't wanna let go of that money. So they said, fine, we'll create a separate pile of that money that goes to these disproportionately impacted communities and we'll help them address their, their local air pollution. Uh, and and it's, it's, there's been a lot of strikes and gutters in this process. Um, they, they allocated a lot of that money to the regional air districts. And for those of you who don't know, different parts of California have different regulatory air quality agencies. And that's really the equivalent of regulatory redlining. Some of us are entitled to different levels of rights and protections than others. And so that's, that's how you end up with a really uh, unfair map in Cal Enviro screen. Uh, I won't bother sharing it right now, but um, you guys just should know that the map of poverty and the map of pollution looks really similar in California and the Central Valley is disproportionately impacted. Um, so uh, I was in Richmond on a community air monitoring planning committee and then eventually Stockton on a community emissions reduction planning committee. And you know the, the AB 617 process was supposed to give us the community the power to prioritize how we wanted to address these things. And so we came at our air agency with um, requests for economic uh, opportunity creation, like help us create an electric vehicle mechanics training program to scale so that people can be a part of the electrification movement and make a lot of money and move into the future where they have enough money to protect themselves. So that when a wildfire comes, you're not hunkering down in your house, you're driving to Reno, like all the people with extra money in their pocket, you can get away from this stuff. Um, but uh, the air agencies really didn't want to let us do that. They wanted to use this money in, in the traditional way that they use it, which is to pay polluters to replace their equipment. So it's been a really long fight where we've been sort of clawing power away from the status quo of air regulation in California. And we still have a, a very long ways to go. 
but there have been some exciting wins in this, and, and that's really in elevating the importance of exposure reduction strategies. Um, you know, I shouldn't have to, uh, you know, defeat capitalism and climate change at the same time when all I'm trying to do is not die 13 years early because of asthma or COPD. And so we made a lot of hay out of um, providing emergency funding to households that deserve indoor air cleaners. If you're an asthmatic household and you're hunkered down half of the year because of bad air quality, whether it's from agricultural burning or wildfires, you should have somewhere safe to hide, especially in a place like Stockton where you're polluted 12 months a year by industry. So we put a million dollars into buying vulnerable households uh, free indoor air cleaners. We put $2 million into vegetative barriers and urban, urban greening strategies. And so, you know, that's kind of what I hope to be the future of the AB 617 project process, because the emissions reduction requirements, um, those aren't on us as a community. Those are on the state of California and the US EPA. The Central Valley has been in a non-attainment status with the Clean Air Act for decades. Um, the Clean Air Act is, is also pretty clumsy. Even if we were in attainment, it would be leaving you out in the pollution and it would be shortening your lives as it is right now. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's what, what, I, what I'm really excited about is groups like yours and groups like mine that have learned a lot about air pollution through the 617 process, whether it's the Community Air Grants Program or the Blueprint Community Program, because the truth of the matter is, Air pollution isn't an accident. It's not some foggy thing and nobody knows where it comes from. Uh, it's absolutely a result of planning. And so while, while there, there's a lot of things that we can learn about air pollution, and we talked a little earlier about how we could use a platform like Sherry's and Rambles to protect ourselves. Um, we could use that platform to say, cancel recess or the air has improved, go back outside. Um, that's, a, that's, that's a part of it. But the other part of it is we need to innovate the planning process. The county, the county planning commission, the city planning commission, they're the ones that are making land use decisions on where to put freeway off ramps, how many Taco Bells and KFCs to allow a charbroiler in your community, uh, how many industrial pollution source get to go in your community. Because they don't let them in nice people's, rich people's communities, right? They keep those places nice. So uh, my hope for the future of this program is for all of us, you know, and I hate to do this, I hate to ask you for more of your free time to watchdog the, elect, the, the employees you elect and pay to protect you, but that's the truth of the matter. We're gonna have to show up in those spaces and own our power, and the data that we're collecting is helpful in those arguments. Um, you shouldn't have to collect this data. Rich folks don't know nothing about air quality. They don't need to. They're protected by power. Uh, but you and me and the communities we're in, we have to run this fool's errand to prove that we're worth saving. And so I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to amass a world of data that says um, we are overburdened and we deserve to be protected. And I want to use that to make planning commissions and city councils and county boards of supervisors uh, think twice before they put another warehouse in my community. Uh, you should know Stockton's the largest logistics hub west of Houston. And we exist so that the Bay Area can one click a bamboo toothbrush or a free range yoga mat so that someone can pretend to be sustainable while living in Kensington and they're idling heavy duty trucks next to our elementary schools. So um, I think at the root of all of this is uh, air quality is, a, is, a, is an expression of power in California. Uh, educating yourselves and coming together around an issue will give you more power. And I think it was laid out really clearly today that um, folks have had enough, and it's not fair for us, our bodies, to be the, you know, we're the credit card that industry uses to continue to enrich itself. California has never had more money. There's never been a richer region in all of human history anywhere on this planet. There is no excuse for us to be a part of absorbing this pollution and not being compensated for it, not being set up for it. Um, so, uh, I think as more communities like ours wake up, we're going to change this dynamic across the state. We're going to remind the California Air Resources Board of what its priority is, which is to protect lung tissue, brain tissue, and cardiac tissue, and that it's not always our responsibility to solve problems for industry and to set the, get them through the permitting process and get new, you know, get the economy going. They always threaten us with jobs and new economic activity. 
Um, and I'm all in favor of those things. I love paper. I love being able to spend it on what I need. Um, but at the end of the day, if you do the math, this practice of polluting poor people is too expensive and too destructive to go on. So we owe it to ourselves. Even if, even if you don't care about other people's kids, you had a terrible kindergarten teacher, uh, I hope you had a good economics professor because protecting our communities from chronic pollution is not only the right thing to do, it's a fiscally conservative and sound thing to do. So I hope to continue to work with you all. Oh, and I'll just say, I wish I had a Valley Vision when I launched on this pathway, because uh, I didn't have any organizing skills, any sort of thoughtful process or partners. I was really just an angry park ranger planting trees um, who got thrown into this mix around air quality. And so I still have a lot to learn on all this and we're gonna keep learning together. Oh, I, the last thing I wanna say is, uh, there are two major things going on in the California Air Resources Board, which is a special agency with lots of potential if we own it and if we influence it. And one of them is the AB 617 blueprint. So 617 was extracted from California by climate activists, and it has clauses in there that will require state agencies to change the way they do business based on the results of community monitoring projects like yours, um, it had a five-year trigger to revisit the data and the plan to, to set up those policy changes. Um, and activists within, a, within the AB 617 family uh, triggered that early. So we've been rewriting a people's blueprint that will prioritize the priorities of our communities as opposed to um, sooner, as opposed to waiting for the five-year deadline. So the AB 617 blueprint process is something that you can, you can Google It'll show up on the CARB website. You can sign up for a notification uh, and I'll share these with Adrian if he doesn't already have them. And you can attend those meetings and you can sit in there and you can listen to some of, you know, forgive me, some of your elders in the air quality work. And, you know, I'm not on that committee. I, I sit at the feet of people like Miss Margaret Gordon from uh, West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project and Kevin Hamilton from the Central California Asthma Collaborative. And they're in there really working the state to improve how it treats our communities. So that's a way to get involved in this community air protection conversation. And then the other one is all about the paper. And it's the 2022 economy-wide scoping plan for carbon, for greenhouse gas neutrality. California made a pledge to get us to net zero on greenhouse gases and how we spend that money is gonna say a lot about our values and our priorities. And I'll tell you right now, there's not a lot of folks like us in that conversation. That plan is pre-baked and cooked up with industry interests. And then they share it with the community as an afterthought and asked us for a rubber stamp. Uh, we got a hold of that process and forced them to create an environmental justice advisory committee. And those meetings are ongoing right now. And it's a way for you to set compass points on the way the state spends money on how we handle our, or really our, the crisis of global climate change that's threatening California. So excited to meet you all and at your service. Thank you, Matt. I'm clapping. Give him some clap emojis, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. We really do look forward to continuing to work with you and, and with other, other similar communities across the state. Build you bet. Questions. I'm going to drop in the chat my email. Anybody can reach out to me if they want. Um, Thank you. Pleasure meeting y'all. Of course. Well, this has been a wonderful day. I have learned so much. It has been wonderful to meet so many of you who are, you know, living in living in North Sacramento, Oak Park, and elsewhere, and just interested in and in, in passionate about this topic. Um, so, one quick thing we wanted to do before we call it, because I know it's two, is we wanted to do a group photo. So, if folks are able, it would be great if you could turn your video on and smile. <laughs> And uh, I will I will do sort of a screen cap uh, and save it for everybody, uh, and then we'll hopefully folks are okay with us just kind of like having this and you know documenting documenting uh, our event with this. So not ready, not ready. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'm gonna take a pick in five, four, three, two, one. Smile. All right, you guys rock. I'm gonna save this so it keep. I love the family picture. That's beautiful. Thank you. Okay, folks. So, in terms of follow-up items, um, again, really appreciate everyone who made today possible, including Valley Vision's co-equal partners at Civic Thread, Breathe California, 
and green tech. Uh, the four of us are really equals in doing this work with funding from the California Air Resources Board. We're really, really excited to really be working with you all to, to move this work forward. Um, again, there, we, we are privileged to have uh, secured another grant to continue this work and deepen it and expand it. So we want you all to be part of that. We want you all to be continue to be involved and we can, we can really advance equitable environmental justice actions uh, at our neighborhood scale. Uh, and this is, this is a really, really, I think, good momentum building uh, event to, to do just that. So um, we'll be following up with you all uh, early next week um, with regard to stipends. So those of you, you don't have to live in the four main zip codes to receive. I have, no problem, thank you. Um, I, I have everybody's email. So I will be sending every community member who's indicated they wanted a stipend, a uh, $100 stipend um, next week. So just keep an eye out for that email and, and I'll include additional information about that at, uh, next week when I send that stuff out. Um, we'll also be just sending out some links to some of the great things shared, what we'll save the chat and, and, and share with you all some of the resources that folks, folks were able to provide. Uh, and then we're gonna, we're gonna have, have a, a, a team convo and then we wanna come back to you all with, with some takeaways uh, from this, including a recording. Um, because again, what we're trying to do is create these community air action plans for North Sacramento and for Oak Park to really uh, be able to begin the work. So um, we will be in touch. We have, I have all of you guys' info from, from when you registered. Keep an eye out for your stipend because you all deserve to be paid for your time and then keep an eye out for some helpful links and more information on next steps. So thank you all. Thanks for organizing this, Adrian. Thanks, of course, there's, there's a lot of us. <laughs> Have, have a happy Saturday, everybody. Thanks. Okay. Let's go outside. Outside. Thanks, Adrian. Let's go outside. All right, bye, everybody.